Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have a super awesome guest, but before we get into that, if you would like to support us, please check out our shop. We have stickers for sale, and we have shirts and sweatshirts with the first 50 guests on the back. Today, I have on Mr. Sean Gallagher. Sean is a Lancaster County native who has been active in the music scene for over 30 years. As a member of the garage pop band, Modern Day Pharaohs, and solo acoustic performer, Gallagher has held virtual residencies at the Lancaster Dispensing Company and Quips Pub through the 90s. After taking time to pursue a PhD in behavioral neuroscience, he returned as a multi-instrumentalist supporting singer-songwriter Angelo M. Gallagher has had a long-time interest in Celtic music, and in an effort to take that sound in a modern direction, he formed Salt Hill with guitar bassist Carl Greathouse and fiddle player Michael Verjanic. Great House brings influences from his history as a founding member of the guitar rock band I Wish I and Forjanic has a fiddle style that draws on his creation roots. Together with drummer Steve Schwartz, they blend their own songs with a mix of reshaped modern and ancient covers. Check them out on some upcoming gig dates with Salt Hill on July 30th at the Gary Owen Pub in Gettysburg and September 17th at the Stoner Grill in Lancaster. And also check out his band's Modern Day Pharaohs tomorrow at the Stoner Grill and Great House with his band Great House September 24th at Lidditz Craft Beer Fest. With all that said, how are you doing today? I'm great, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'm curious, at what age did you start getting, uh, what influenced you to become a musician? When did you start picking up your first instrument and what was that first instrument? Uh, I started playing guitar at uh, 13. And uh, that was in late junior high. And then moving into high school, uh, quite uh, fortuitously, um, the orchestra instructor was desperate for double bassists. And uh, it was Jane Bry who um, had a tremendous influence on, on many musicians around here. And Jane just did a call for guitarists. She wanted people who had familiarity with guitars or instruments of the sorts because uh, she believed that uh, they could, they already had a, a kind of a head start that they would need to learn how to play the double bass. And um, the, uh, the upright bass to me just seemed like the, the coolest instrument at the time. I was a police fan at the time, and Sting played this, uh, occasionally played this incredible electric upright bass that I thought was fabulous. So um, with, uh, with Jane's encouragement, I picked up the double bass, and... Um, so with the guitar and bass skills in hand, I think those two instruments were like the perfect platform to then start putting together uh, high school garage bands. And uh, I've, been doing, I've, been, I've been doing a mix of those three things ever since, the acoustic guitar, upright bass, and putting together, uh, putting together bands. So what was it like as a high schooler to bring together a band and actually practice maybe... Did you guys ever perform? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, we were, I mean, for high school, we were, you know, remarkably good. Um, uh, the uh, drummer's father, uh, Tom Wood, worked at WGAL, and he had an idea of, of, the, of, the, of the tech that was necessary to put on a rock show. And um, I also had other bandmates who, um, who were musically competent, um, uh, you know, my Bandmate uh, John Shively uh, was uh, was already a really good piano player, and I shoved a bass guitar in his hand. I said, "Here, <laughs> you can figure this out," and uh, and he did. So we, uh, you know, we had our we 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 played a, a full high school dance our freshman year. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, and and it was very you know, it, like I said, all, all the right pieces fit at the right time. I had the right I had the right combination of talented friends. Uh, obviously, having that drummer's father giving us some guidance on what it took to do a live performance, and um, and also the classmates at the high school being willing to uh, take a chance and, uh, and, uh, and and put their classmates up, put put a put a dance in the hands of their classmates. Right. Um, and I, I remarkably, I have a recording of that that was done by another friend uh, on a. Do you remember dictaphones? The tape dictaphones. I don't. Uh, it, it, it was like a handheld tape recorder that people would typically use oh, to, like, to like make police. dictation. And uh, and uh, you know, if if you had an idea, you'd hit play and you would record an idea in your head or something like that. This is stuff like the detectives in the mo old movies have. Like they, they click. yeah, th and they, then they they like shout down an idea. You know, remember to to call so and so. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, she recorded the whole show on a dictaphone, and it sounds remarkably good. And um, and I I'm kind of a uh, I'm kind of embarrassed at how I've lost some of those chops. I listened to, mm. I listened to myself playing. I was like, wow, I was rehearsing. I was practicing more steadily back then than I than I might be now. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So it started early, and then. Um, uh, migrated into college at Penn State, where um, where the fraternity scene was a wonderful place to gig. Uh, there were there were very enthusiastic live music supporters. They paid well. They paid sure. good money for for live music, and uh, by that time, um, the people I was I was playing with, some of them now, um, uh, Scott Kinsey, who's still with the Pharaohs. Um, you know, the two of us were, we, we kind of founded that band while we were in college. Uh, we cut our teeth in those, in, those, um, in those fraternities, and we learned how to do a live show. And we learned how to, you know, mix a room and even set up a stage and lights. And, um, and it, it just keeps, uh, you know, it, it just keeps reinforcing the desire to do it better and better. I'm curious, uh, did any sort of... Did you feel any sort of fame with your classmates' support or with the fraternity support at all? Well, it, it's it's kind of fleeting because uh, Penn State's so big, nobody's going to recognize you mm. kind of on the street. Um, but uh, but yeah, when you were up playing, uh, you were top of the world. Some of the the rooms would be packed, and and again, it it just you know I'm going to sound like an old man here, but people just wanted live music. The the demand for live music and that the shared experience of the live music was was fantastic. And um, and it, there was there was a real live music scene uh, at those places. So what did you go to, f- to college for? I went. Uh, I was undergraduate biology major. Biology major. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm curious, why didn't you choose to do music? I I, I think I wasn't good enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair I enough. mean, I've I'm uh, and I and I think I said this when I when I gave you. Um, uh, my background. I've I've always felt like a jack of all trades when it comes to yeah. music. I do a lot of things well. I don't do anything wonderfully. And um, again, when I was uh, when I was in high school uh, playing the playing the double bass, um, I remember my sophomore year and freshman comes in. You know, she plays bass. And I just, I just surrendered the first seat to her. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna challenge you for that. It's yours. Um, so, uh, and and I think to this day, still, I, um, I wind up dabbling too much in these different domains to really develop any kind of refined expertise in anyone. I think I made district chorus once, and that that was about as that was about as big as it got in high school. So. Did you guys start uh, doing covers in high school, or did you do? Your oh own yeah, thing? it was. Oh, it was all covers in high school. Yeah, um, because uh, you know, just the thought of you know, how do you write your own song? We can't do that. Mm. Um, so writing originals really didn't emerge until after our. Well, we had one or two originals when we were in college, um, and uh, we got them recorded at some you know old school studios around here. There was a there was a studio called. Um, Gift Horse Studios, and I, I remember going through all, you know, go, going through the old tape editing, recording, re-recording back then, and um, yeah, it wasn't until it wasn't until I was done with college that I even tried originals. So what what happened after college? Did, do you guys, the Pharaohs was your high school band, right? Well, no, um, the Pharaohs the Pharaohs kind of emerged from uh, from me and Scott Kinsey, whom I knew in high school, but we did not play in the same band. We mm. got together. Uh, he was at Bucknell, I was at Penn State, which are not too far apart, and we managed to kind of like uh, stitch a musical relationship together across between those um, yeah, on route. For those familiar with Central Pennsylvania, Route Forty Five connects uh, Bucknell and Penn State, and I knew Route Forty Five well. So going back and forth there, uh, the Pharaohs kind of emerged from what we were doing in college. And uh, sorry, I forget the original question. Uh, so did you guys, what did you guys do from there after college? Oh, after college. So after college, um, we moved, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm the most local guy uh, that you could possibly be interviewing here. We moved uh, behind the Friendlies on Oregon Pike. Oh, okay. And we, and we rented a house back there, uh, Scott and I did. And um, we lost the drummer and guitarist that we'd been playing with through college. And we picked up Sean O'Neill, who was another guy I knew. Um, getting back to, um, 
to high school bands. Uh, my high school band was at Conestoga Valley, and Sean played drums in the high school band from Mannheim Township. So mm. we encountered each other through like these um, these uh, collaborative performances that 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 high school kids were putting on. Um, and I remember passing him at Quip's Pub after we'd been out of college. We'd lost our drummer, and I, you know, I caught up. I said, "Hey, man, how you doing?" And uh, I took like three steps away from him, and the light bulb went off, and I went back and said, "You play drums." <laughs> um, and so that was it. Uh, the Pharaohs were a four piece when we were in college, but once we picked up Sean and got things off the ground, it was like we just kind of like settled into a three piece. Mm. And uh, that that's when I think like that's when I think the the, the most the, the, the most successful version of the Pharaohs kind of took off then because we, uh, you know, we wrote some songs together. We're still a cover heavy band. Um, and, uh, but it is fun to, uh, to throw those, um, you know, those off speed pitches at the audience and, um, and, uh, and, and throw a cover in there and see whether or not they notice or if that, if it, you know, the, the songs, the songs fit the flow of, of what we play. Mm. So they don't, they don't stand out. But it is very satisfying when they draw the same reaction that the uh, that the covers do. So, what was your uh, style back then? Oh, it, it was very it was very eighties. We came out of I mean, the Pharaohs came out of um, I know when people think about the eighties, they think about you know Duran Duran and all this keyboard heavy music. But we were much more inspired by um, by people like Joe Jackson um, and Elvis Costello and these artists that were. That were coming out of what I would call this guitar-based pub rock scene, mm. which which actually just harkens back to the 1960s, and you know bands like the Yardbirds, um, uh, and even the uh, the mod movements. Well, the mod movement that you know I'm sorry I'm getting in a little deep here, but bands like the Jam through the 80s were just guitar-based drums. And you listen to the Jam, and you really hear them recycling a lot of what what the Who and the Beatles were doing in the 60s. So. Uh, I guess you could say the Pharaohs were still carrying on that that guitar pub band sound um, that that really started back in the '60s. So when did you decide to move in into uh, Celtic music? Well, that was in the '90s. At the same time, I was playing with the Pharaohs. I would go to Ireland every year with a guitar on my back, and I had um, I had a, uh, uh, a cousin's uncle. He wasn't biologically my uncle, but a cousin's uncle. Uh, who was very much into um, uh, very much into Irish music uh, gave me an opportunity to to go to Ireland and this was my first summer out of college and uh, I actually have some family still there hmm. um, or at least family that I you know recognize and 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 uh, the other uh, keep in touch with so I had an opportunity to go back there take a guitar and 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 Chuck Barr, who was the cousin's uncle, said, "Like, look, you know, bring a guitar. We'll have a great time." And um, uh, we just hung out in the west coast of Ireland. The west coast of Ireland, from 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 Shannon to Donegal, uh, is is just a really special place to me. And I and I I had I was not prepared for what how it was going to affect me the first time I went. And um, and the the way music can galvanize a friendship. I met I met immediate friends there. That I still have to this day, uh, that we connected with over music. Music is still a very, very strong part of um, of uh, of community life, of family life, of intergenerational communication, and that that just really. It, I know it sounds it sounds corny, but that just really hit me hard. And uh, I went there in the nine in 1990, and then every summer it was like I'm saving all my pennies and I'm going to go to Ireland for another summer or for as long as I can next summer and next summer and next summer. And um, that was still on the heels of, of um, kind of the uh, kind of the folk revival that was happening in Irish music. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I might be going on too long, but that oh, in a nutshell, that's, that's what did it. When I, when I was introduced to, um, uh, when I, when I int was introduced to like the turn that the band that the Waterboys were taking at that time and, and Luca Bloom was taking at that time, and Paul Brady, um, and all of these Irish musicians who were, um, who just seemed to be, um, they weren't playing like what I consider corny Clancy Brothers Irish music. They were, they were, they were playing music that that seemed to still hold up and carry messages that were relevant to today. Yeah, it's it's always interesting. Um, 
at the college we were gonna get we were planning a trip to go to Ireland to uh to sing around you know mm-hmm. take a tour of Ireland. Unfortunately, the day that we were supposed to go got canceled because guess what? COVID. COVID. Yep. Yeah, but um, it always inspired me how the Celtic music always has such powerful lyrics and uh, imagery mm-hmm. in them. What was, I'm sure, uh, how did that, the, the Celtic music you encountered in Ireland, how did that differ, differ from the American music that you were used to? Well, that, that might be the thing, that to me it didn't. I saw the similarities. Oh. Celtic music was still rock and roll to me. And I, I mean, I think nobody, nobody demonstrates that more than the Pogues. Um, uh, the Pogues were, um, were a, a band that emerged out of the kind of post-punk scene um, in, um, in England. Uh, but a lot of them were members of the Irish diaspora. And uh, so they were, they were taking that, 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 those traditional songs and they were recasting them in a way that made you think uh, maybe this is the way the song was originally played. In, in the pubs, and maybe maybe the uh, maybe the the translations when they took these songs into the studios, the whoever was doing the production there, maybe they were sterilizing it. And you got a, you got a feeling that when you listen to what the Pogues were doing, that that this may have this was probably what was really happening mm. in the pubs, and 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 on the streets when the musicians were playing. Uh, so it was it just it was just rock and roll to me, and it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big leap. So what were some of the maybe the culture, cultural differences that or culture shock that maybe you encountered? Was there any at all? Or? Well, um, the culture shock was how much more they appreciated live music again. Um, you know, the uh, uh, still when I when I go to meet friends in in Ireland, you sit down, you have a meal, and then it's give us a song, Sean. Give us a song. Give us a song. And you pass the guitar around the table for for two hours after yeah. dinner, and um, you know no matter no matter what your ability is, no matter no matter uh, you know you'd have somebody who's running around chasing a kid uh, for most of the night, and then they just say, "Hey, you know, Johnny, get over here, play play a song," and they'd have to drop everything, and they you know it was it's it's incumbent upon you as a guest or as a as a as a social participant. To, to offer music if you have it in you. Really? Mm-hmm. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's so cool. It's, it's um, I can't equip, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Did the, um, <clears throat> so coming back to America, how did you translate what you learned from Ireland into your music here? Well, um, I, I, while I, was, I mean, the pharaohs were doing the pharaohs thing. There, it wasn't the place to kind of introduce right. a, a Celtic uh, thing. Um, but as I, as I was doing my solo acoustic performances, I was connecting with other acoustic uh, musicians. Um, uh, one being, uh, I, I played with a fellow, Andy Miller, who was a fabulous flat picker. And that's when I connected with Angelo Melaseca, who goes by the professional name Angelo M., because he was also gigging at Quips while I was at Quips. We were, we were kind of in the Quips uh, booking cycle. Mm-hmm. And so when I played Quips, I played solo acoustic, and I would connect with people like him. And Angelo was coming from a much more American roots and blues angle. Andy was coming from, um, uh, a, a, like I said, a bluegrass angle. And when I took what I had been learning from, from the Celtic stuff with them, the three of us really hit it off. And we really, um, and we played together uh, as, um, uh, as the Boys with Wrinkles. Uh, we played together as a trio at the dispensing company for, for a long time. And again, uh, a lot of credit for this. I, I, before we went on the air, I was telling you about um, the importance of having Every music venue, it's not enough to have a cool venue. The cool venue has to be, has to be um, directed by somebody who understands music and understands yeah. how the music fits the venue. Uh, you had a great interview with Rich Ruoff, who did, did exactly that with a chameleon. He did not just have the physical chameleon, but he knew how to shape the musical sound and the scene to fit the building. Um, uh, similarly... Uh, Frith Garstang did the same thing at the Lancaster Dispensing Company, which used to have a very small stage, which was which was kind of like wonderfully restrictive. The Pharaohs were a three-piece. They were one of the few bands who could actually fit on that stage. Mm. 
Um, but when we played the dispensing company, when I played the dispensing company, I was playing the dispensing company as a solo acoustic act. And then the next week I'd be playing there as part of the Pharaohs. And then the next week I would be playing with uh, Andy and Angelo as the Boys with Wrinkles because, because Frith trusted me. She was just like, yeah, okay, you, you know, put together something. It's like, hey, I, Frith, I've got a new idea. I'm going to bring in this, this, and we're going to play this. And she's like, sure, go ahead. And to have, to have somebody running a venue that supports live music who trusts you to take chances and trusts you to take risks, um, that, is, that is absolutely invaluable to a musician and I also think to the music scene. And, um, and Salt Hill was kind of born from the momentum that came up mm. from me connecting with uh, acoustic musicians. And then with, uh, with, from Angelo, we were put in contact with uh, Mike Frigenic, who is from Steelton, Pennsylvania, and he comes from this very strong uh, Croatian community uh, based in Steelton, where, where again, they have that community that's very much like the one I encountered in Ireland, where there's a, where there's a cultural appreciation for music uh, that, that you don't see in many places in the States anymore. Um, and so, uh, so Mike is bringing this um, Eastern European fiddle influence into things. And so while, while adhering to, uh, to the Celtic stuff that was inspiring me, I saw how these other guys and how these other other influences could shape the music, and that's that's really what um, that's really what Salt Hill tries to embody. That's awesome. I'm I'm curious of uh, what does Croatian influence mean in, in like music terms, right? Would you know at all? Or? Well, well, it's um, you know there is. I, I wish Mike were here. Um, there is there's something about the scales that you go to when you when you go to play a solo. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of parallels and Mike and Mike can, can shift gears into Irish, you know, Mike can play Irish Whatever. fiddle just as well. But then, um, uh, I, I kind of, um, Irish music often lends itself to, to what, uh, what, what is, um, what's called open tunings in guitars. Open tunings rely a lot on, on drones. Yeah. And when you're, you know, it, it's all roots and fifths, mm -hmm. okay? And when you, when you kind of pull the thirds out of, out, of a, out of a chord and you're living in that, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little music wonky here. When you're living in that, in that world that doesn't recognize the difference between major and minor, it gives, it gives um, uh, the soloist, in our case, the fiddle player, a lot more room to wander, yeah. and and you can feel you can feel an interlude drift into are we in a major key or are we in a minor key? And the minor keys, um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not speaking as an expert, but the music that Mike is playing is is I feel more often pulled into that into that into that kind of uh, tense minor key feel, and um, so. Mike can take that uh, that that traditional Irish melody feel and then bend it in that in that just slightly unsettling way that makes things feel just a little dark. Yeah. Um, and it and it really it really lends for a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of cool Moments. spooky stuff. And I think I think the road that you've got dialed up here is is a song that um, that embodies that pretty well. Because it's it's me playing. I'm playing uh, an open tune, uh, 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 dad gad tuning. If, if if anybody's really interested, and I all the chords, all the chords I'm playing. You know, I think I think the most complicated chord involves two fingers, on on the on the guitar. So if you want to learn through guitar. the whole song, through the whole song. So absolutely, if yeah. you want to if you want to learn guitar and and kind of like, you know, get yourself a good tuner and and find a couple dad gad chords. Um, but um, there's 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 a different approach to playing guitar in Salt Hill. It's actually um, uh, I, I consider that I consider Carl and Mike to be more of the lead players, mm. and I'm as a guitarist, I'm I'm playing a very percussive style, and I'm locked in with what Steve's doing, um, and and listening to Carl and Mike float. So you can again, the road's a great example of that. You can hear the bass and the fiddle. Uh, floating in their direction when the guitar, all the guitar and the drum are doing, um, we're just we're just driving that background. Yeah, it's so interesting how uh, instruments can be used in incredibly different ways to incredibly different effects, and mm -hmm. it's all music, mm -hmm. the same. Um, 
I've had to take that learning journey as a piano player uh, where it's mostly lead stuff mm -hmm. if you're solo. But once you're in a band, you immediately become more of a rhythm player yeah, yeah. by necessity. You're right. So uh, you want to talk about the road? We'll, we'll play it. We'll we'll play it a little bit. And... Yeah, sure. The road was my attempt to write. Um, uh, when you're when you're playing in a Celtic band, you're you you're putting your music up against all of these all of these tried and true staples. There there's something that people expect uh, when you do that, and um, it's challenging to write a modern. Modern what, what do standard. you call it? a modern a modern standard a modern right. standard or a modern quote unquote traditional song? Yeah. And the road was, I think, our uh, as so far has been our best attempt to do that. And we don't want to do we don't that doesn't that's not only what we want to do. A lot of our songs do sound a lot more contemporary, but it was it was it was my attempt to write a traditional murder ballad. <laughs> well, with that said, this is the road from Salt Hill. place you never saw the fire i told you we'd be dancing you know that we'll be clear but only in a home 50 miles from here Whoa, race the way i told you i'd be coming back for you someday you know that we'd be dancing i told you we'd be clear there's a light in a window 50 miles from here That was Salt Hills the Road. That was pretty cool, man. Oh, thanks. Uh, is there a difference do you find between writing for a Celtic piece and then just uh, any anything else, or is it all the kind of the similar same? Um, I, I don't. If if something really grabs me, I, w I will try to write it in that Celtic vein. But a lot of what we do, like um, uh, you know, if you. You play the other two songs that I that I sent you. Sorry, not not to not to press you on that. Uh, you'll see that they they do have um, they still carry that acoustic element, but it, it is a little more contemporary pop, um, and uh, and so it 
I'm, I'm not sure if I'm losing track of your original question, but I don't set out to write a Celtic song. You don't say, okay, this is this will okay. this will fit this. Um, if if the hook is there, uh, and if the if the message feels like it'll fit that 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 Celtic vibe, it'll work. Um, but if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, you know, a lot of songs I felt myself the last the last song that we that we completed. I, I can never I can never write in a vacuum. I, as soon as I start writing a song, I was like, okay, this feels something like that. And um, you know, one of my favorite songwriters is Smokey Robinson. And the last song that I wrote. I feel like um, I, I feel like it, it came from a very uh, Smokey Robinson place, but then when we play it, you know, it, it sounds like Salt Hill, and no nobody listening to it would ever guess that that's where it came from. Huh. Um, so so no, there's there's no real I, I don't have a, a Celtic methodology when it comes to writing songs. Oh, okay, because no. um every genre there's a different like taste or. Uh, Something that makes it that genre, right? Mm-hmm. The, in regard in regards to the lyricing and the the music, obviously. Right. I just I was curious if that if that at all just changed. But you're saying it whatever fits the vibe is what it's gonna be. Yeah, yeah, and then that might hurt us because uh, you know if if we were to go pitch ourselves as a Celtic band, and uh, you know play like a Celtic festival, we're not gonna give you a full set of Celtic music. It's right. it's it's gonna be kind of. Um, uh, it, it's going to be Salt Hill. It's going to be um, it's going to be what we feel works. Um, we're we're a hard working rehearsing band. When we when we rehearse, we it's um, uh, you know we we hold ourselves to we discipline ourselves to to working on a song and working on a song and working on a song. And uh, when we feel something that works, oh, we're not worried in what kind of musical direction it's taking us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's um, it's kind of like uh, again before we went on air, we were talking about music and and musicianship, whether it's within the band or between the band and the audience, being a conversation. And when you're rehearsing a new song, when you're trying to write a new song, uh, there's 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 this nonverbal recognition that says yes, this is working. Let's keep moving it in that direction, and then it lands where it lands. And um, as a band, we might pay a price there because people might look at us and go, ah, I can't really can't really pinpoint where point, you're coming yeah, from yeah. yeah that's the struggle for bands that maybe want to cl- uh, combine genres or bridge place mm-hmm, bridge genres mm-hmm. and because you guys because you're right that's the, it's because you have the croatian you have the irish and then you have you know the 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 american in you as well it's a collage of it's not purely celtic music it's it's an influence of a lot of different music and it's all being created without the intention of being a Celtic song anyway. Right, right. So I'm curious, uh, why go, you? because you went back to college for a PhD in mm-hmm. neuroscience. What what made you, what steered you in that direction? Um, I'm a nerd. Um, I like solving <laughs> problems. I like working on puzzles. Um, uh, I, and, um, and I also, right out of undergraduate, right out of undergraduate, I walked into the world of ophthalmology. I was a medical tech. What's ophthalmology? Uh, eyes, eyes, eyes and eye you. surgery. Uh, I was a medical tech, again, super local, right down uh, um, Lidditz Pike, uh, across from um, uh, across from there was a there was a shoe store, and I, I worked out of a little private practice office, and um, I was working at at a time when. Uh, LASIK surgery, the corrective eye surgery for nearsightedness, was just coming on the market, and uh, we had uh, a, a fabulous new surgeon who came to the area, basically kind of like to bring these procedures to the area. And um, I worked at that office under the tutelage of, of uh, Bart Halpern, who is a recently retired uh, ophthalmologist, and um, and he was doing all of these surgeries that involved a lot of measurement and a lot of technology and a lot of data analysis. Mm -hmm. But these were surgeries that really had kind of unambiguous success rates. That that is, you knew when the surgery worked, when the patient could see and everything was great, that was successful. And I was responsible for taking a lot of measurements and doing all the, um, uh, doing basically doing quality control for these surgical procedures. And uh, I just fell in love with um, the practice of, of making vision better. Mm. 
And so when I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school to study how vision and visual perception works. And um, my specialty at that time was, I mean, I know it sounds, it sounds simple, uh, but how does, how does your visual system keep you from running into things? Like when you, when you walk through a doorway, it's, it's automatic. You don't have to think about it. But what's really happening is that your visual system is processing the, the edges of that doorway and, pin, and, and directing you toward the center and said, this is the best way to go. Similarly, the same visual system that gets you through an open doorway is the uh, visual system that allows you to catch a ball in a sport. Right. You know, if you're, if you're out in the outfield shagging fly balls, um, the brain of a center fielder is doing um, remarkable math, math yeah. uh, automatically to get under that fly ball. When you look at them, when, especially when you, when you look at a, a, a ball player chase down a ball in a dead sprint, there's so many calculations. How fast do I run? What direction do I run? When is the ball going to make contact with my glove? That, that the brain just does automatically. And it sometimes only takes a glance, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen so many clips of baseball people are, like when a batter hits straight towards the pitcher, instinctively, mm -hmm. it's, he doesn't need to almost, it, just one look, right? and he can tell where it's going to be and he catches it, or right. you know, most times they miss. But those, yeah. those clips. But, but the, that they ever catch it at all, because right. that's happening, um, you know, there, there's a, there's, you know, I could, I could drag you into my classroom and give you my 30-minute spiel on exactly what you're describing here. Um, the higher centers of the brain are not involved in, in that reflex at all. It's a, it's a very, uh, your, your visual system, your visual system sends one message to your cortical brain where you recognize faces and read letters and recognize colors. But there's also a, a, a less appreciated secondary system that almost goes straight, straight from your eyes to your brainstem. And it's what allows you to, to, to orient yourself if, if something's falling on you or if a ball is suddenly coming right at you to get your get your glove up and protect yourself, because the speed the speed is too fast for well, conscious thought. Right. Um, so so yeah. So I love doing that stuff. Uh, working in ophthalmology and it, it's a very people people mostly walk out happy with with what was done. It's it's a it's it's very satisfying work. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a job at Millersville. Uh, the, teaching that stuff. I, I also teach, I teach statistics, I teach the history of science and psychology, um, and I teach evolutionary psychology, uh, but that is, you know, I'm, I'm the vision guy. That's awesome. I, yeah. I've had, uh, I'm cross-eyed, mm -hmm. and um, I've had, what, three surgeries? I think maybe... Uh, strabismus surgeries. Did you have it done locally? Uh, no, I, I'm originally from Salisbury, Maryland. Okay. Um, but uh, I always went up to Wilmington to a uh, Dr. Milner. I don't know if you mm -hmm. might maybe mm -hmm. not familiar yeah. because I, I I would have his first name, but I was mm -hmm. a kid. <laughs> it was always Dr. Milner. He'd he'd have the uh, the those toys where uh, it would fall down and collapse like the string toys. Mm -hmm. uh, always look over here, look over here, and mm -hmm. uh, what would you call those surgeries? Strabismus surgery. Strabismus yeah. surgery. Did they make you? Did they have a little book where they had a housefly and they made you grab the wings of the housefly? Do you remember no, doing that? I don't. No. Well. This was when this was back in two thousand and two, so okay. I would have been like three or four at the time because mm -hmm. they just wanted to correct it early on. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's very important because your brain needs um, your brain. The the better aligned your eyes are, the better your brain can can. It's it's important for your brain to be able to match those images because that's it's it's a it's an important way to process depth. People mm. people don't realize how much of a disadvantage they're at. If they were to lose vision in one eye, because everything still looks sharp, you can you can lose vision in one eye and still read. You can still quote unquote have twenty twenty vision, but the loss of depth perception is 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 pretty severe. Yeah. So what does <laughs> this is weird? I know I have cross eyed uh, cross eyed, but I don't know what it I could does. talk to you for an hour about it. <laughs> we could, we could do a whole different podcast if you want. Uh, can you give it to me in layman's terms? Um, well, it depends on, uh, there are ways to test how well your eyes are working together. Yeah. And I mean, if you don't mind me saying so, I, I noticed that as soon as we, as soon yeah, as I, I met you. I, um, I figured. And, um, and uh, it, it depends on whether or not when somebody has misaligned eyes, the brain is not going to tolerate the double image. Right. So what, so what your brain kind of learns to do is to either ignore one eye altogether, and that eye is then referred to as a lazy eye. Mm -hmm. Or if if your if your 
lucky, your eye learns to alternate and pay attention to one eye at a time. Mm -hmm. And if people are good alternators, then you can develop good vision in each eye independently, even though the eyes are not learning to work together. Huh. And someone like that, there is, once upon a time, it was believed that if somebody had misaligned eyes into, an adult, into adulthood, there was no point in trying to align the eyes because the brain would never understand how to, how to make them work together. Right. But there is an increasing amount of evidence um, uh, that suggests that it can happen if the eyes do get aligned, the brain can learn to then gauge depth in the way that, um, that it would have had your eyes been aligned normally from day one. And um, who was it? Susan, I forget her name, but there's, there's, a, there's a book that you'd probably like called Fixing My Gaze that came out about 10 years ago now um, about a woman who went through that, had misaligned eyes through most of her life, got surgery to align her eyes, and then she tells the story about how once the alignment was done, how, um, how her depth perception emerged, emerged. That, that what, what we call the binocular depth perception or stereopsis emerged. And, and it was once believed that, uh, that if you didn't get kids corrected by, say, age 10, um, they would never be able to develop stereopsis. Um, but that's, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm curious because the brain is uh, such a powerful tool, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure, and it can learn all sorts of things and relearn certain things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that w that were the case. But granted, I'm not an expert at this at all. Mm -hmm. I just know I have cross eyed and and I can make make the eye go this way and it goes that way. Mm -hmm. Now, when you cover one eye at a time, is the world still pretty clear? Oh yeah, I can see you perfect, uh, pretty pretty fine with, and I can also switch perspective from different eyes as well mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's good that's a good that's a good start that's that's promising for your prospects of being able to get good stereopsis yeah and you're right with death perception because i remember um i was a boy scout i'm, I'm an eagle scout mm -hmm. and uh congrats thank you mm -hmm. and uh f w w whenever we did mirror badge college there would be like shooting and archery and all that jazz mm -hmm. and for a shotgun shooting it's whatever whatever dominant hand you are mm -hmm. right and then uh, whatever eye that corresponds to. I'm right hand dominant, left eye dominant. Okay. So, so oh, yeah, bad combination. Bad yeah. combination, uh -huh. very yeah. bad combination. So whenever I, because uh, if you're right hand dominant, you're using your right eye to see. Mm -hmm. But since I, I wasn't focusing with my right eye, the pigeon would go past yeah. and I would always miss it. Yeah. But as soon as I just, I told my instructor, I was like, what if I just switch to my left eye? And you're like, that's not possible. I'm like, well, I'm just going to try it anyway because mm -hmm. I think it'll, it'll work. Yeah. And immediately it start, I, I mm -hmm. hit all the clay pigeons. Right, yeah. It almost benefit you to wear a patch over the other eye probably. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I remember as a kid I'd always have... When you're doing that, not, not for good. Right, of mm -hmm. course, yeah. Uh, did you go through the patching? I did go through the patching, mm -hmm. yeah, as a, as a kid. Well, I'm pretty sure that was just because after surgery they had to cover the eye. Because, or maybe because it was tender? or well, well, what they want to do, it depends on what kind of patch it was. If it was like a cotton pressure patch, then that was probably something after surgery. But if it was like a pirate patch. It was like a pirate patch. What they're trying to do is that they're patching the better eye. And they're, oh. they're, they're compelling the brain to pay attention to the eye that it might be ignoring. I'm, I'm really simplifying things here. Right. But, um, but if you're not alternating 50-50 and you're not giving each eye an opportunity to see the world, and one eye is getting... Yeah, I mean, one eye is literally getting a larger share of your brain than the other eye is. Right. So what you do is you patch that eye and you make the weaker eye fight for its fight for its territory in your visual cortex. So should I, as a person with cross-eyedness, should I make a, uh, an effort to use this eye more? Um, it, it, it depends. I don't know. First, you know, I, I must start with a caveat. Right. Consult your doctor. Consult your doctor. Of course, this is not medical advice. <laughs> and don't, don't do it when you're behind the wheel or doing something important. But I, I think when you're doing something like reading, um, it's the, the ability to improve the acuity, um, you know, quote unquote, at your age. I'm speaking to somebody who's probably half my age, and I'm, I don't mean to make you feel no, old. No. Um, but the ability to improve acuity, I don't think there's as much evidence for that, but if both eyes, if you're capable of reading a book with both eyes, um, you know, talk to a doctor about uh, your prospects for getting the alignment. Uh, did you ever do, were you ever given a, a Brock string, 
like it's a string with a bead on it, and they put yes. the bead in there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go practice your Brock string. Uh, That's, this is something I never thought I'd learn about. <laughs> so long way from music, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> getting back to music, how is there any connection? Uh, and I'm speaking, of course, there is uh, between the the brain, the music, uh, even eyes mm-hmm. that maybe you found. Um, well, well, for me, uh, you know, I'm I'm a very mathy, techy guy. Uh, when I look at a guitar, I see, I see patterns. I see patterns all up and down the fingerboard. Um, you know, chord shapes are patterns. Intervals are patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, frequencies are patterns. Yeah. Um, and, uh, when, when you recognize that it's, it's kind of funny because the, um, the imperfection of, of a fretted instrument will, will drive you. If I'm, I'm talking to anybody who plays guitar out there. The imperfection of a fretted instrument will drive They're you nuts, nuts. because uh, there's just um, what you're, you're just compromising, you're hedging, you're going, okay, well, I'm going to put the 12th fret here, and that'll be a perfect octave for these strings, but it's probably not going to be a perfect octave for those strings, because if you make it a per- perfect o- octave for a string that's this thick, it's probably not going to be a perfect octave for a string that's that, that's that thick. And um, so the math and the techie part of music... Um, uh, fascinates me, um, you know, hearing and the difference in different instruments, what makes an instrument sound great. Uh, uh, again, guitar aficionados will talk to you about the, the pursuit of tone, what makes, a, what makes an amplifier sound good to you. And as a neuroscientist, um, I'm, not, I'm not content to just sit back and say, well, that amplifier is better than this one or this works in this. I want to know why. And um, and so I, I want to know the whys about what makes a guitar sound good, what makes a bass line put in, in, in a bass line that counters a guitar line, why does, it, why does it work sometimes and why doesn't it work other times? And as we were discussing before we went on the air, I think a lot of this has to do with um, uh, the human brain, first and foremost, is, is wired for language. It's, it's wired mm. to understand language. It's wired to use language. It's wired to respond to language. And language is about, is about so much of language is about rhythm and pitch, rhythm and pitch, rhythm and pitch. And, uh, and we don't appreciate that when we speak to each other. Um, unless, unless, well, you might not appreciate it, but if you are watching a bad actor, I, I, was, I, was reading, I was reading a review, I was reading a review about a Shakespearean play um, a couple weeks ago. I think it was a review in the Wall Street Journal about a Shakespearean play. And the, the author, the, the writer, the critic, was talking about how the lead in the play had something down that the other actors were not, mm. that the other actors were not able to live up for. And when you're doing Shakespeare, uh, like, like I'm an expert in Shakespearean theater or anything, but uh, when you're doing something that is, it, it's, there's a style. Yes. There's a there's a cadence, there's a rhythm in the exchange that has to be right. And you knew that Shakespeare understood this when he wrote that. He wrote this thoughts. line this line goes da 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 and then it comes yep. back with da 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 da. That's rhythm. That's yeah. what music is. So when we when we write music, what we are doing is we're tickling those centers in the brain that are probably responding to language. And and those centers have expectations. They have expectations about rhythm. They have expert expectations about pitch. They have expectations about um, uh, about about um, mood. I mean, think of how you know the way somebody utters a phrase in a movie or a play will evoke you emotionally the same way an instrument played in a particular way will evoke you emotionally. Um, and and in my opinion, it's coming. It's 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 using the same software and hardware mm-hmm. they're they're taking music is taking advantage of all these things that have already been laid down by our language centers and uh and again that's why that's why a musical exchange is is just as satisfying and can be just as exciting as a good conversation you know a, a one hour conversation the time flies a one hour jam session the time flies wow. Because you are connecting with another human being, and on, a, and on an emotional level, you are all saying, "I understand where you're coming from." You don't have to put it into words. I understand where you're coming from. Let's move it in this direction. Let's move it in that direction. Okay, now let's move it back in this direction. Music is an extension, 
or music is exploiting, uh, it's an extension of language and, it, and it's piggybacking on all of those mechanisms that, that make language work so well for humans. It's, it, there's a saying in theater, um, when it's too much for words, you sing. When it's too much for, for singing, you dance. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's, it plays off that right. very well. Right. When, because it, 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 you're right. Imagine tone and diction is everything mm-hmm. in a conversation. Mm-hmm. You can say, that was a good job. That was a good job. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. right. <laughs> you know? right. Well, it's why text messaging gets us into so much trouble so much because trouble. because you cannot you cannot decipher the affect without um, without actually hearing you're not hearing the song and the rhythm right. you're reading the words but you're not hearing you're not hearing the pitch and the rhythm and you're imposing your own thoughts and context onto that right. that's why that's why social media is so mm-hmm. so draining a lot <laughs> of times because we can't we can't uh, we can't understand how that person is saying it what that person is actually saying right because I can say. That was a good job, and mean completely different <laughs> something else. I could, or I could say that yeah. was a really that was a good job, yeah. and, and that means you know, it was a really good job. Right. It, but you can't discern that behind text unless unless you really really understand the person. Even right. but even then, uh, wives and husbands get confused all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people have known each other for years. Yep. Right. So I'm curious, what is one of the most interesting uh, things that you've learned? in regards to your uh, studies about the eye, about the brain, and all that jazz? Um, uh, how much is automatic and unseen, if you will? And I mean, I mean unseen in the scientific way. We were uh, you know, talking about uh, that baseball player catching a fly ball. Um, uh, you have a visual system that is sensitive to the rising and falling of the sun that helps mm-hmm. to set your circadian clock. And we yeah. humans, once we invented the light bulb, we have been uh, hijacking and messing with that up, messing that up. Um, and uh, and our, you know, so so much of our, uh, and and thankfully, right? So much of our, so much of our, what our brain does is done without our conscious awareness and help, yeah. um, uh, because it's simply, it's simply, um, it, it doesn't need it. Right, right. Right. Imagine if you had to think every time you blinked. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and, and again, just getting back to music, uh, it just it just works. Yeah. Why does it just work? Why does it? Um, Why does my uh, hand automatically know how to go from a C to a G, mm-hmm, right, mm-hmm. without even me thinking about it? Right. Which makes which makes teaching music. Uh, you know, um, you know, I I, I got to give so much credit to what you're doing, and and you have you have such a broad palette of 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 guests here. Um, uh, so you're going to have. Um, you know when when Don Grabowski comes in tomorrow and talks to you about uh, the, his glove system, um, how that benefits musicians. The yeah, yeah. Um, teaching somebody, uh, teaching somebody how to play a guitar is like teaching somebody how to swing a golf club. You 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 just do it in front of them and go look, it's easy, and you there's no way for you to. I mean, we can we can reflect on when we were novices learning an instrument. Um, but you know, for, for guitarists, the, you know, all, all three of my kids picked up guitar because I, I've just got them laying all over the house and um, they're, they're better than I am. My <laughs> daughter is a much better finger picker than I am. Um, but of course with guitarists, the big mountain is bar chords. How do you do a bar chord? How do you do a bar chord? Uh, and, that's where and, I and stop learning. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and it, and, uh, for somebody who's been playing guitar, you play, you, you just, you just land on it. You just, boom, there it is, there it is, there it is. And you can remember that it was hard for you, but you can't remember why it was hard, and you mm-hmm. can't put yourself in the position of that person who's learning. Um, so, um, so teaching, uh, you know, I, I guess my point is that that a teacher, a, a music teacher, really has to work to put themselves in that mindset that they have not had for years to say, okay, this is what you're experiencing, and this is where I have to. Um, I, I have to be able to put myself in your shoes and, and understand what your current obstacles are now. And so much of w- when you finally do overcome those obstacles, you do it automatically. There's, yeah. not, there's, not, something, there's not something that you suddenly did, did. That, that you can put your finger on and say, happened. that made the difference. Uh, it, just, it just happens to work. And so the best music teachers, I think, are the ones who can scrape below those layers and understand how to get to um, how to put themselves back in that naive state, and and say, okay, this is this is where you are, and let's let's try to build from here. 
it's incredible because um when I when I was uh younger, um I'm only twenty two, <laughs> but uh I tried to learn how to play Journey mm-hmm. by. I tried to learn how to play Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Oh, that's a brutal place to start. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, not knowing, uh, not being taught most of anything on piano, but I can just do my own thing. Okay. And so trying to get the bass line, do, 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 mm-hmm. with the do, do, do and, and having that rocking all together, it took me at least a few months, and I almost gave up on it. But mm-hmm. one day, it lit- it just happened, and, it, and I have it ever since. I'm sorry, I can't help it. So you didn't stop believing. I didn't stop believing. I, I was almost there, mm-hmm. but then I didn't. But see, as a guitar player, I had the same thing because that that song landed when I was in eighth grade, mm. right when I picked up the guitar. And so, uh, you know, Neil Sean comes in with this guitar riff, which is which is very trite, but he plays it very cleanly and very fast. And when you're a still opening guitarist. When you're a new guitarist, you know, start start the, easier start and, and easier. work your right, way up. Course. Don't do the number of high school bands I saw doing rush covers in my day was just unbelievable. And and there was just something something inside me just wanted to scream, stop, stop. There, there's um you know, there's a there's a reason why um why uh more bands do REM covers than rush covers. Mm. You know, REM was that uh that garage band so so um you know for for anybody learning guitar and i and i've been able to to kind of share this with my kids and other other people who are beginning um it, it's very useful to to come up with that um uh you know class, classical right you 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 learn any instrument and of course you you remember the series of of your your musical instruction books you know, yep. have the level one level two level three whatever it would be it would be very useful if somebody could compile that for uh, for pop songs for for mm. for people who are you know that that kid who um, wants to learn how to play guitar because all the difference in the world you can when when you play an instrument uh, when you're learning an instrument um, my my first guitar instructor was Herb Erickson who taught at Don Randall Music over at the East Town Mall and he was an old um, he was an old army band guitarist. Oh, wow. uh, he must have had great stories, and I was just too young and, and naive to understand. Uh, but he understood that, okay, here's the lesson book. Here's, here's, the, here's the Mel Bay lesson book for guitar. But here's, here's a pop song I'm going to throw in, too. So he knew, he knew how to do that in parallel. And so he, he had an understanding of how you could start with this. Don't start with Don't Stop Believing. That's yeah, all, no, that's I, all yeah, I'm no, saying. I, you're right. It, People want to start piano by learning uh, "River River Flows Through." Have you ever heard that piece? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that is a very hard piece to put together. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have to learn chopsticks. So you have to learn yeah. you have to learn the simple stuff first, yeah. because that's that's how you build on your repertoire. Right. And once you get your you know scales and arpeggios, scales and arpeggios first, mm-hmm. then it's it's gonna make the uh, the line for uh, "Sweet Child of Mine." Is gonna right, make right. It's gonna way more right, sense, uh-huh. and it's and you're gonna have that under your fingers, way because that's a warm up scale that he used right. and put it into the song, mm-hmm. and you're not gonna have the chops to get that warm up scale, and unless you know your scales already, right, right, and you know the fretboard, I because uh, I did the same thing with Sweet Child of Mine. I, I want to learn that song, uh-huh. and uh, I got it, but I didn't understand why, uh-huh. and even now I'm gonna I have to think about which fret. It, or what string is this on? Mm-hmm. But because I don't know the scales, mm-hmm. but so if you start with a foundation, you're gonna be able to go way further and remember it way longer. Mm-hmm. We have some some more of your songs. We're kind of rounding out our radio time. Uh, we have some of your earlier oh uh, geez sets. <laughs> so we have we have Gallagher with. Uh, with Angelo, Angelo M. Mm-hmm. No, this me. is this is one of Angelo's songs. I have to be clear with that. Okay. And that's just 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 me and bass and backup vocals there. But that was just to give you a sample. Um, but so this is never be the same, mm-hmm. right? What? Is, tell me a little bit about this piece. Oh, it's it's uh, classic Americana, uh, lost love song. Guy screws up, and uh, can never go back, and is. Uh, in self pity, you know, like like you should you should talk to Angela. This is again, right, this is course, Angela's this is Angela's song, um, and uh, I played bass with Angelo. And uh, when Angelo wanted to put a band together, uh, he's a fabulous guitarist. Does not need another guitarist with him. 
and it was me and the late great Oz Christ. Uh, we were a, a kind of a, a folk power trio. And Oz comes from uh, uh, the the metal world. Uh, Oz Oz looks like you know he's he's all tatted up and he looks angry as he can be when he was playing. But he is such a great guy and he is such a fun musician to play with. And um, and he he had this snare drum. He had this beautiful snare drum. And uh, I played bass with Angelo. And as a bassist, your mentality goes somewhere else. And to, to just get into a good jam with them and to just lock in on the sound of, of Oz's playing when you're playing bass was, was just, you know, it's just one of, those, one of those peak experiences as a musician. Um, so this, is, uh, this, isn't, this isn't one of those super intense songs, but this is, this is a, uh, like I said, this is a, a lost love ballad. And with that said, this has never been the same by Justin, uh, uh, Angelo M. Angelo M., yep. think she's lonesome Her friends know she's blue And they know it may take some time She gets over you And it may seem crazy To let you get away But it would surely be insanity To try to let you stay It'll never be the same, no, won't never be the same After watching all you have go down the drain Trading in her love and trust for cheap love Now she holds the hand of a loving man Together they grow old Somewhere far away An old lover, tired and sad Sits in a self-inflicted loneliness In a memory of what he had Cause it'll never be the same, no after watching all your work go down the drain Trading her love and trust Now he's the one in pain There ain't no way it'll ever be the same Now they 
both know it'll never be the same. And that was Never Be the Same by Angelo M. Angelo Meloseca is his full name. Angelo Meloseca. And I'm sure you can spot, spot, find all of that on Spotify. Yep. Uh, we have one of uh, your Modern Day Pharaoh songs. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't that... Wasn't you? Wasn't you. Wasn't you. Yes, recorded 30 years ago. How old were you 30 years ago? Not existent. Okay, there we go. <laughs> 22. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you'll see how 90s we were at, at this time here. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit of what it's about? What's the style? Um, it's, it's very... It's 90s abstract lyrics... Um, jangly guitar stuff. Uh, it's um, you know, and 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 we've been kind of like rehearsing some of these old songs, so it's it's pretty, it's pretty um, it's pretty surreal to um, at at fifty four to to be rehearsing um, a lyrics that you wrote as a as your twenty three year old I'm self. Sure. Um, but I th- I think it holds up pretty well. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, you'll hear. Um, this is myself, Scott Kinsey, and Sean O'Neill, and we are still together, and we'll be at the Stoner Grill tomorrow, tomorrow night, night with Gene Pellin. Gene, uh, Gene, again, talking about talking about venue owners who who push for uh, live music, and Gene Gene has built a um, a haven for live music. He he built, a, you know, he's got an establishment that is live band ready, mm. and um, uh, the the old days of um, you know schlepping your gear. Uh, into into a venue or watching bands schlep their own gear into a venue and then uh, not mix it well or or not have the sound well. You walk in there, Gene knows what he's doing. He'll do the mix for you. He'll do the lighting for you. And um, uh, it's it's wonderful just to be able to bring an amp and a guitar into a place. And, uh, and again, at my age, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lug power right, amps of course, <laughs> yeah, anymore. So, so yeah, so the Pharaohs will be there tomorrow night. Tomorrow night starting at 7? 7.30. 7.30, yes. So with that said, this is Wasn't You by the Modern Day Pharaohs.
that was Wasn't You by the Modern Day Pharaohs. Please, dude, be sure to check them out. They have, you guys have a Facebook page, right? Yep. Facebook page, Modern Day Pharaohs, and you have Spot. Are you guys on Spotify? No. No. Yeah, all, this, all of our originals were written before Spotify. Gotcha. <laughs> Is there a place where people can find them? Uh, it, it, probably. Go on Facebook and, and, and email us. We'll, we'll send them to you. <laughs> well, with all that said, please, yes, go check them out. Stoner Grill tomorrow. And there are other upcoming performances in the description. So please check them out. Uh, Salt Hill has their Facebook page and everything else. Dude, yep. Are they on Spotify? Rev- uh, Reverb Nation. Reverb yep. Nation. And that's, yep. I believe, is that in the description? It should that's, be. It should be in the description. Yeah, I think so. If not, I'll put it there. Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah, it is. we're slow in getting a proper uh, a proper recording done here, but it's right. hopefully in Mar- the works. Marketing is the bane of of all musicians. <laughs> well, yeah, we're also yeah we're also uh, you know, jobs and life gets in the way. Right, exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. With all that said, I hope you guys have had a awesome time listening. If you want to follow us, please be sure to check out our Instagram or Facebook, or just search up the story Corey Rosen. That's C O R Y, no E. R-O-S-E-N on all streaming platforms. You can find me there. And if you want to check out our upcoming guests and events and extra things, please be sure to check out our Instagram at the underscore story underscore podcast or facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. We're going to keep going on on there, but for the radio, we're going to get you guys back to the music. So... I'm curious, how do you, because you're also a teacher, mm-hmm. how do you balance your music life with your uh, profession, prof- like professor life? Well, as, as you can see, you know, we're not on Spotify because I've got a professor life. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, I, I'm, you know, I've got three kids. Um, you know, one is still a senior in high school. The others are off in college. Uh, so it's, you know, that's, that's been my priority for a good long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, we just, fit it in where we can. My, my wife is great. She understands that, that this is part of what I do. And, you know, it's, I've been a musician for as long as she's known me. Um, so she's very supportive of that. Uh, and, um, and, uh, so I, I just fit it in when I can. Um, and I, um, my bandmates do the same. We, you have to do a lot of, you have to do a lot of rehearsal prep on your own. Mm. And that's that helps because you have to make every minute of rehearsal count, and uh, we're pretty good at that. Uh, when it comes to Salt Hill, um, I, I said this in a previous podcast. I give so much credit to Carl Greathouse, who knows he knows how to run a disciplined rehearsal. I mean, for any musicians out there, um, socializing is great, chatting with your bandmates is great, but pay attention to your rehearsal time. You book three hours of rehearsal time. And if the first 20 minutes is catching up, if that's essential to what you're doing as a band, that's great. Um, but, uh, but you'll get a lot more done if you, if you just running rehearsal. It's, it's funny, Carl's, Carl's not a, a, a professor, but, but he runs rehearsal the way I would run a class. You have to come, and I'm speaking to the educators out mm-hmm. there, you have to come with a lesson plan. This is what we're going to do today. This is what we're going to accomplish and um, and Salt Hill, with the benefit of Carl running practices that way, um, uh, has we get a lot done in the in the few times that we do rehearse. We rehearse at least once a month, um, uh, whether we need it or not. Um, and that's uh, important too. And that's important. Um, and uh, so the progress is slow. The originals come out slowly, but when they do, and also I think. Uh, when it comes to writing original songs, um, I I think it's it's important to vet the songs before an audience, because once oh, yeah. you've written a song, once you've written a song, just because you have a structure, just because you have lyrics, doesn't mean it's done. And uh, you know the song for the first, you know, a song should be a living thing for as yeah. long as it can, and you record it when you think you've gotten it to a mature point and. After you, after you record it, it can still emerge farther, yeah. and that's that's kind of uh, if you're not if you're not if you're like me and you're kind of like studio phobic or you're just a procrastinator, there's there's deep regret when you put a song down and then you come up with something playing it live and go oh we got we should have recorded that version of it, um, so I don't mind I don't mind having the originals 
still living in the live only land mm -hmm. for a while. Because uh, I, I know there are a lot of, if, if I were a young musician, if I were trying to, you know, break into the Brooklyn scene or something like that, I would feel pressured to have kind of the, this package of original material that I could use to sell to uh, establishments. Um, I, I feel like I, I have enough of a reputation locally where I can call people up and get gigs as I, as I want them. I, I don't book a lot uh, for Salt Hill, um, and the guys seem fine with that. Um, you know, we're very selective in where we play. Um, but uh, but the the original songs, I think, still have to live on their own in the live world for a while before they get recorded. I don't know. Again, did I lose track of your original no, question? No, I, I mean, well, <laughs> see, most of these questions evolve into different answers anyway. Mm -hmm, okay. Uh, so, but uh, that makes a lot of sense because, first off, the, the song you play is never going to be played the same right. anywhere. Right. And you're always... And here's here's what I've learned, uh, people, you know, re remastered versions are released all the time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So and and, that, and that's the, a song should be living. You're mm -hmm. right, uh, all the time, and because and it's de facto living because it's going to be played uh, differently at a restaurant versus a live event right. where you're right. where you're going to go into solos and and the jams mm -hmm. and all the vamps and all right. that jazz, at, versus a restaurant where it might or it, or at a concert per se, it might, well, depending on you know whoever's watching, mm -hmm. it's just going to be straight through, right, right, one, once and done. But other places, it's going to be uh, depending on the feel. If it's at Roots and Blues, it's probably going to go on for a mm -hmm. jam for right. a long time, and people are going to be up there dancing and partying. Uh, so in you know loudness, how loud is it going to be? Right, uh, right. Are you guys the main focus like at a concert, or are you guys uh, the 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 back stuff mm -hmm. at, at a restaurant where people are eating and, you know, living right. their lives. Um, so you're right. So I'm curious, what, what did your uh, kids uh, think whenever they learned that you were uh, like a local band guy or did they, did they, I'm sure that they, they knew of it, but what were their opinions? Did they, uh, yeah, their well, music or? Early on, I don't think it was any more interesting than my being bald. Uh, you know, it was just like, oh, it's just what dad, it's just what dad is. It's just what dad does. Um, but uh, as as my as my kids have grown up and they've kind of developed musical tastes of their own, I think they have a little bit more of an appreciation of it. And um, and my my oldest son, who is uh, who is a great guitarist, again a better um, you know he's he's like a, a, a student of Hendrix and is really mm. into that kind of a uh, kind of that stripped down. Technical. I'm I'm just gonna have you know I'm gonna focus on technique and I'm just gonna have a fuzz pedal. And and uh, and a vibe pedal, um, but he's also he's also kind of found his way to American roots through through the Grateful Dead. We just uh, uh, we just saw Dead and Company um, with John Mayer at um, I, I almost said the Vet, the Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia um, a couple weeks ago, and um, back in the early two thousands, you know, he was three, four, and five years old when I was playing with Angelo. And Angelo and I did a lot of, uh, we didn't do a lot of dead songs, but Angelo really nailed songs like, um, like uh, Me and My Uncle, and uh, he really had nice original versions of it. So, so now that my son's older, it's very satisfying to take him back to recordings mm. of me working with Angelo and him going, that's great, that's, you know, that guy can play. Right. Not, not me, Angelo. Um, so, uh, and this was a guy who was like walking into our house. We were rehearsing in my basement while he was up there as a three and four year old. So, so as, as he's getting older and doing that, uh, that's very satisfying. Um, my, uh, my other son is, um, is a fantastic drummer and he is, he has been a substitute drummer for Salt Hill. You know, he played his first bar gig at 16 years old behind Salt Hill and, um, and and did a fabulous job, so that that was kind of a, a an ultimate parent moment mm. when um, when your own kid is 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 the drummer behind you at 16 years old, uh, and um, and and my bandmates were just you know they they just loved it because I know the first time I said hey let's um, I think uh, you know this drummer's sick or can't make the gig I said I think Adam can cover the gig. And they were like, right. And I said, give him two rehearsals. Right. And we rehearsed two. You know, I, I gave him a set list. He was familiar with the songs we were playing. 
and he he did fabulous. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, what about your students at Millersville? Did they, did they ever realize? Oh, you're. I don't. I don't promote it. I don't. Of course, uh, of it's and and a lot of my a lot of my colleagues are kind of uh, they're kind of um, they 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 like dropping the bomb on the students and be like, hey, Gallagher's band's playing Friday night, and they're like, Gallagher has a band. <laughs> yeah. um, so so I've been outed by my by my colleagues a number of times, um, but uh, you know it's it. Whether it's whether it's teaching or performing live music, it's performance and right. and holding attention yes. and reading the audience. What do I have to do now? Am I am I losing the crowd? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every 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 teacher, professor, instructor can tell you about that feeling about being you know halfway through a class and you just feel the attention is spinning out of control that that you're 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 losing them. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of parallels between that experience. Uh, the, the 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 knot in your stomach that you get when you feel you're losing a class is the same knot in the stomach that you get when you feel like oh geez we have to turn this set list around what are mm -hmm. we doing here we have to redirect kind of like you know that classic scene in the Blues Brothers where they show up uh, show up at the country bar and they realize that they're not going to be able to get away with playing their own their own music you you have to you have to think on your feet and and hold their attention and. Um, so yeah, so so uh, being a professor is is very performative. I don't like online education. Um, oh, me uh, neither. I you know COVID was um, uh, was a brutal time for my students. I you know I don't care what anybody says. It was um, it it was uh, it was a lost year and a half. Yeah. Um, and I, I understand the reasons for doing it, um, but I think we learned a hard lesson about online ed uh, through COVID, and that the um, the the peer pressure that students feel when they're in a classroom of other students who are paying attention and engaged um, is an essential part of education that that we that we forget about when we when we when we uh, when we believe that we can when we can reach students individually um, and when we turn education into watching TV uh, I have no patience for the argument that that this is the future. Um, it is a it is it is a workable it is a workable method for the rare intrinsically motivated student who 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 probably could sit down with a textbook and learn the material on their own right. anyway yeah. that student's going to be fine in the online ed, ed department uh, or in the online ed um, format uh, but human nature being what it is. Learning, learning is a communal experience. Learning is an experience that, that is shared just like performing music. You feel it happening. Oh, Lord, I did. I mean, I'm happy to be able to do it, but I did a number of, of those Zoom benefit concerts where we were all kind of like set off in our own room and we strummed our guitar to our computer screens. It was better than nothing. Right. It was, it was better than nothing. But it, there was just there was just a painful, deep right? sadness yeah. to it. <laughs> There's a deep sadness to performing like that. So the experience I had in doing Zoom concerts is is exactly the same experience I had in teaching online. The audience needs to be together, there. learning together, experiencing things together, sharing the experience together. Yeah, I didn't even think about it. You, you brought up um, the peer pressure aspect of learning. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about that before, but you're right. I didn't learn. Well, granted, I have ADHD, so it was, online education was awful yeah, for me awful. regardless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but because I wasn't surrounded in a room with like-minded people, unless it was like music, something I actually cared about, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and not to say that... Wait, here you have to take, I took music composition and by default Bible degree. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say I don't care about the Bible as a Christian, but there were some topics that right. I just, right. you know, you just don't care mm -hmm. care for. Right. Uh, and oftentimes I'll out myself that uh, the morning class is with a particular professor who has a very monotonic voice. Yeah, yeah. I would, right. I would just lay in bed while, mm -hmm. while he spoke. Yep. And um, granted, there are, uh, I don't I'm curious. Have you ever delved into the studies of having something on while you're sleeping, and if that helps learn or? I, I don't. All? I don't think it no. does. I think if anything, I discovered that. I think if, if anything, um, uh, it it, I I I fall asleep faster. <laughs> like like it just. Uh, there's something about 
there's something about putting, and I did do this a, a number of times, you know, figured, okay, well, I'll, you know, I, I don't do as much reading as I'd like to while I'm awake. So I'm going to start doing um, audio books mm. and maybe I'll get a chapter of an audio book in while I fall asleep. And there was just something about having somebody speak to me while I was listening to one of the books. It, it, it actually accelerated my, my sleep. Like I was falling asleep faster. And, uh, and so, no, I think, I, think, I think there's something about um, putting headphones on when my head hit a pillow that shut my attention off even faster. It was a great thing for oh, my sleep of course, health. Yes. But I don't think it, it, took me, it took me a long time to get through that book. I have noticed that that whenever I'm like listening to something, I, I'll listen to someone playing like a, a relaxed video game or whatever, who just has a nice voice, and I'll gone yeah, immediately. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, so, interesting, but uh, in regards to online learning, it was especially learning music. Ooh, you yeah. right, oh, you can't. Yeah. That's that's not possible. Yeah. I I I'm so happy that. Uh, LBC went went back to in person mm-hmm. um, after what the one semester that everyone was off right mm-hmm. right and uh, because mu- learning music having to do like forum uh, a, f- a forum here is like where everyone's together and at, they perform mm-hmm. in front of each yeah. other yeah uh, doing that online right and, the, and, and the pressure was off I bet the anxiety oh, yes. wasn't what it was yeah it, you, and that's you know, such an important part of performance is, right. is those nerves because you have to keep, take control of those nerves mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's that's the art of music theater mm-hmm. and uh, performance is that you you have to look at everybody in the audience and then put out all you have right. to them and that is god awful experience mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for those who aren't trained in it right. and um, I can't I did a vocal forum because I wanted to learn more about the voice and all that jazz as a composer. Mm-hmm. And I could sing perfectly fine in the studio, whatever, by myself. But of course you can. Right. Everyone sings great in the shower. Mm-hmm. But when you're put in, in front of an audience, yeah. it, it starts yeah. shaking. And, uh-huh. it, and it's, it, it's, it's immediate. The, and you, learn, you lose all of that on, on, uh, edu- on the uh, virtual learning. It's great for one on one, on one on one, like independent study, like yeah, like sure. you said. Mm-hmm. But for a classroom, yeah. If this had happened when when I was uh, it, when I was like in my uh, middle school or first grade years, and there there have been a few studies on this that they've lost a a a, a portion of growth, because, mm-hmm. like the social aspect or or whatnot. Oh yeah. I I right. want I wonder how. And we kind of talked about this pre-show. I, in middle school, I decided I wasn't going to speak. Awful decision for my mm-hmm. for my voice right. and speech. I can't imagine what, what what it was what it would be what the effects will be or what we'll find out mm-hmm. uh, in the future because students lost one and a half to yeah. two years yeah. of social communal learning, yeah. um, and just the social cues because. In person, and this is why I kind of push for in person interviews as well, because it's com- it's a completely forget the technical issues that can happen, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just the seeing the actual eyes of right. somebody, right. having that uh, reading high, the crowd, reading the crowd mm-hmm. uh, in person, body language at, at a at a virtual in virtual learning, all you see is the top half. You don't you right. can't and right. so much of our legs and our uh, just other body. Other other positions speak right. so much to how right. we're feeling, and I can't imagine uh, having to do that forever. And that's not the right. way of the future. Right. It's a, it's <laughs> students students projected an indifference online that they never would have face to face. Oh right. Because of course you know when I was doing Zoom, I think you know my my computer could only handle like a maximum of 12, 12 faces at a time. At a time, right? So so if. I, I think the students very quickly realized that if they were the ones who had their screens off, they would be on the subsequent page, and I wouldn't see them. I wouldn't know they that could they do whatever there, they want. and they could do whatever they want. And even the ones that were did have their their screens on, you'd see them in bed, you know, with their right, pros, exactly. yeah, props that's, up that's what I would do. It's like, yeah. I, what do you? I I had to take a summer class, uh, online a summer online class because. This wasn't because of COVID. It's because I had to. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time, I worked at a factory, at, uh, and I was <laughs> moving boxes around. Uh, we made military clothes for the army, mm-hmm. 
military clothes. For, of course, that's what they're right. <laughs> we make clothes for the military. Right. And uh, so we had to move packaging around, and uh, I would have my earphones in, driving the forklift around, whatever. And uh, they would, he would ask me a question, like, oh, crap. I got to pull out my phone. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, respond to it. I was like, uh, so I just, I was like, listen, just to let you know, I'm working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, it, at that point, it was more like a podcast <laughs> mm-hmm. thing right, uh, right. Th- than actual learning. Right. And I can't imagine what it, w- how the future would work or what consequences that would have if we chose to do that forever. Yeah. Because it's never been done before. Yeah. yeah, and like if you're in Antarctica or something like that and there's no choice, there, there's sense. a place for there's it. There's a place for it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, speaking of the military, I had students who were, um, who, who were stationed in remote places and uh, the, the, the online uh, teaching that was happening during COVID allowed them to pick up a class or two that would otherwise have not been available Possibly, to them. Yeah, so so I, I feel for those students. Yeah, I, I get yeah. that. And I'm glad that opportunity was there for them. Um, but it's it's a it's um it it it's it's it comes with compromise. So. so what are um as a teacher, what what is your philosophy in regards to teaching your students or as, as teaching in general? Do you have one or oh a philosophy. Um I'm lucky to be at Millersville. I'm lucky to be teaching at an institution where I face no more than, uh, you know, maybe 40 students in a classroom, in a big class. It's always less than that. It's usually less than that. So by the end of the first month of, of classes, I, I pretty much know everybody's name, uh, which allows me, again, that, that social pressure, it allows me to give them that look if they've missed class for a day <laughs> where do you look um, at the screen to <laughs> yeah 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 you don't have that with the screens um so um you know my philosophy is is uh is to kind of you know keep them on task to recognize where they are to remember who i was when i was mm. 18 19 20 years old and um and to to you know to to encourage them to and and you don't need to you don't need to encourage them from the ground up. Sometimes you just need to just give them that little nudge that, yeah. uh, you know, that, that student who's sitting in the fourth row in the back corner of the room who thinks that you don't miss them when they skip class, you give them little, you know, the little smart alecky, hey, nice to see you when they right, come in the next day. And, and there are some people who would go, oh, that's horrible. You're, you're, you're demeaning the student. You're making them feel small. Um, and maybe for a second you are. Yeah. But... They they appreciate that, and then they'll they'll come back the next day and and uh, and realize that they were and, seen. Yeah, and realize that they were seen, and well, uh, and that they will be missed if yeah, they exactly. if they skip class. Um, so um, I I I'm fortunate in that I feel like what I teach is is often easily relatable to to their lives. So mm. um, it's not difficult for me to um, to to demonstrate. "Quote unquote real world examples that tie in what I'm teaching about to uh, what matters to them. I teach uh, research design and experimental methods, and uh, so I, I have a lot of in class demonstrations. We teach people about um, teach people about what makes science work, why science should work when it doesn't, um, and why it doesn't, okay. and and the kind of like the guardrails that are supposed to be in place to to uh, to keep science on track." Uh, when I teach sensation and perception, I'm teaching them about how vision and hearing work. And I encounter a lot of students like you who had, um, you know, they were patched as kids and they are learning a little bit more about, um, about what that means for the way they see the world. Um, and why uh, it happened. <laughs> and why it happened. Uh, you know, sometimes you don't know why it happened, but, um, but uh, demonstrating to them that... Uh, demonstrating to them, you know, the, the differences between them and somebody who has good stereopsis and what they can do to, to compensate or close that gap. I teach a lot about hearing and hearing loss, which is something that is becoming more and more concerning to me yeah. as, I, as I am like 54 years old, listening to loud guitars and drums for a long part of, for a big part of my life. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very satisfying. I, th- I think the students I work with for the most part are there because they want to be there, um, and um, you know, it's it's. I I think I have a, I think I have a great job. I like what I do. I have great colleagues, great friends among my colleagues, 
uh, it's it's a very satisfying environment to be in between what I get what I get from the students and my and my colleagues and what I feel I can deliver to the students. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So, um, regarding educators, what are some maybe mistakes that you think some educators or maybe maybe you have have perhaps made, uh, and how? Can you speak to that and uh, advise against or or for alternatives? Ooh, um, boy, there's a loaded question. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna just run out there onto the thin ice. Um, uh, the um, the learning styles philosophies I think have done more damage than good. Explain the learning styles philosophies. Uh, a a well-meaning supportive instructor. Uh, if, tells a f- fourth grade student that they are a blank kind of learner and these people a visual are a learner blank kind of learners. And an audio, I didn't want to uh, say it, but yeah. Um, as, as soon as you start doing that, you start, um, you, 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 basically, you basically create a platform of confirmation bias that that student is going to stand on for the rest of their lives. Mm. Um, there's, there's very little evidence. I mean, of course, if, if somebody is completely blind, um, you are, you're not, you know, your visual learning style is not going to be, your visual learning is not going to be what it is for somebody who right. is sighted. Um, but, uh, but these, but these labels are, are, are dispensed with, uh, with so much ease. Um, and by the time the students get to me in college, uh, they, they approach certain tasks with an, I can't attitude. Oh, that's because. that's this. I can't because yeah. somebody has told me this. I can't because somebody has told me that. Um, uh, the science behind different learning styles is scant at best, and the people who are quote unquote doing these diagnoses um, uh, often don't have the background that they that mm-hmm. they need to be delivering such diagnoses. Uh, additionally, they do not have a prescriptive plan for how. For yeah, how, for if you know, because in a perfect, you know, if if this were really a thing, you should be able to sort three groups of students. Let's let's say you have you have visual learners and auditory learners. You should be able to separate students into the visual learner group and the auditory learner group, and then you should be able to give two different lessons to each group. Let's give the visual learners the auditory learning task or the auditory learning lesson and the visual learning lesson, and we'll give the auditory learners the auditory learning lesson and the visual learning lesson. And then you should be able to demonstrate that the auditory learners did better at the auditory lesson than the visual learners, and nobody has nobody has um, nobody has done research to that really? extent, where where you can you can make a valid case that first of all the diagnostic categories are accurate, and right. secondly that a um, that a teaching plan serves those groups independently. Uh, who who doesn't learn better? When their learning is supplemented by pictures or stories, um, and I would go, I would go back to that to that individual who um, is is completely blind. Um, their visual cortex uh, is still very active. I mean, it, it's it sounds kind of paradoxical to to some of us, it but a light, but it? well, e- even even a person, um, you know, there are extreme cases. There are extreme horrible cases where where um, there's a there's an awful childhood. Cancer that's called retinoblastoma, oh. in which um, in which if it's not treated early, uh, this this is a very aggressive cancer that goes from the retina right to the brain, and uh, parents are faced with this impossible choice sometimes of, of 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 removing their children's eyes to save their lives. So wow. here here are, here are people who are completely non sighted. If you bring an individual like that into a room like this. They'll still have a sense for where the walls are. Yeah. They'll still once if you let them explore the room, they'll they'll see where that ta- they'll, they'll they'll I use the word see, um, because the the brain mechanisms are still in place. They'll know where that table is. So when they walk into an environment, their brain, the same brain that that is fed by our eyes, mm-hmm. the part of their visual their visual cortex, the part of their visual brain, still gets filled up by the by the image of a room. Right. Even if they cannot see that room. And they are using that image. They will use their knowledge of that image to navigate their way through a room and, uh, and understand where they are. So, so you could even argue that someone without eyes is still capable of visual learning. Um, 
So that again, I'm getting way out here that we could go for an, another hour explaining that. Um, but nobody, or, or you and I could walk through this, you, know, you could walk through this building with your eyes closed. And as you're walking through the building with your eyes closed, you might bump into a wall or something here and there. But well, you might not. well get out the door, yeah. Um, because you're 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 monitoring where you are in space. You have a you have a memory map of this building, and you are using that to and get you have through the that. audio cues as well, right? And so, I guess it's the same kind of concept of when you know when all the lights are off in your house, you still know your house. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, so uh, don't don't slam the. I, I just think you're slamming the door on. Um, on on a kid when you when you when you uh, you know it, we we talk about how labeling is bad in so many other respects but uh, we have no qualms about saying well you are you you do this well or you do that well I teach statistics and I have had so many students come to me and say I'm not a math person they they regard they regard math as something that is um, that is abstract and apart from their everyday encounters and experiences. And when you can take math, when you can take numbers and anchor them to examples that they can, uh, tangible examples, uh, you'll see that math is not an, it's not abstract. It's something, it's, it's, a, it's a tool for describing something that is very, very concrete. Yeah, and, and math is, you do math all the time whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, it's not, I don't like math. Mm-hmm. You, can, right. you can not like math. Right. But to say you're not a math person, you know how to balance yourself mm-hmm. without having to think about it. Right. Ma- math is something you do in, inerrantly, mm-hmm. whether you like it or not. You <laughs> Gas mileage, right? Right, right. <laughs> when, when am I going to go get gas? Mm-hmm. I, I can know that at, the, at the gas, this gas price, it's going to be X amount of dollars. Mm-hmm. If I wait a little bit, it might go up or down, and it'll be that much more. And, you know. Right. Yeah, and tipping all the time. Do I have enough gas to get off the turnpike and exactly. not pay and not pay for it at the rest stop where I'm going to pay six dollars a gallon? Right. Yeah. Am I going to wait to the till I get to the turnpike, or mm-hmm. am I going to wait till I get off the turnpike to fill up on gas? Right. Because you know, because of the different gas prices, and we do math all the time mm-hmm. without uh, real even time. Yeah. You know, how much? Right. How much time right. am I going to have? Am I going right. to have thirty minutes? Right. It's still math. You can feel those fractions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. That's that's such an interesting uh, perspective because. I, what so without that so you you believe that it, it's or uh, you would say that it, it would be a mis, be misguided to tell somebody that oh I'm just you're just a that learner and and uh, ignore everything else it might it, it it might be true that people do have these different kinds of learning styles um, the applicable science that would serve such a diagnosis Isn't is there. is not there. So what what is your uh, what uh, application of learning do you ascribe to? The application of learning I ascribe to is um, small class sizes, where you can monitor an individual student and say, "What are you having trouble with? What are you having trouble with?" That that is much more effective than than saying, "Oh, you're a blank kind of learner and you need to do this." Mm. Um, uh, and and again, I'm very fortunate to be teaching in an environment where. Um, the class sizes are still small enough where I can where I can keep tabs on those students, um, and the obstacles the obstacles are are often not cognitive. They're often time management. They're <laughs> often study skills. They're often um, preparing for the class. Uh, there's no college students out there. There is no substitute for understanding what's going to be covered in class before you walk into the class. Because if you walk in there. If you walk in there with an anticipatory framework of what's coming in, and you can hang the new knowledge on an existing structure, uh, you're going to retain that knowledge much better than you will if you are just walking in uh, completely, uh, you know, just just completely unaware of what's on deck. Right. Um, so, uh, and you will save yourself hours of study time just by just by investing a little bit of prep, as we call it. You know. If you don't have time to read the chapter before the instructor covers it, skim the skim chapter. Skim at least. At least. And, and, spark notes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's, even if it's spark notes. Don't use spark notes for, the, for studying for the cool. exam. Right. But use it to, to prepare for the class so you know what's happening. Ask questions if you're confused, if you're lost, if you don't know what's happening. Uh, sure, maybe an instructor will be a jerk and blow you off. 
that's their problem, not yours. Yeah, right. Keep asking, keep pursuing. Um, I I have uh, many many cold and lonely office hours <laughs> in my life. You know, I'm supposed. Uh, there, there, I, there hasn't been a week of my academic life where, where every one of my weekly office hours was occupied. So, um, uh, students, especially if you're at a, a small college like this or at Millersville, your professors are accessible, go bug them. And if, and if, and if they cop an attitude tough, bug them again. Well, it's, yeah, it's right. Their, it's their job. It's their job. It's their job. And you don't learn anything without asking questions. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, I wonder if we uh, prepare our students to learn correctly. Do you? Yeah, that's another one. I don't know that anybody's really scienced that out, except for things like um, uh, prepare. Um, uh, uh, one of the buzzwords in education is scaffolding. Um, make sure you are supporting them. Um, it, it, just like... Um, just like having a good conversation. When you sit down with somebody and have a conversation, uh, if you're sitting down with a stranger, you have to assess who they are, where they are, what their knowledge set is, and then you build a conversation on what they know, what your shared interests are. And, and what you're doing is, is, is you're adding little pieces of new information on top of what they already know. Mm -hmm. But you first need to have an understanding of what they already know before you can put that new pl place in. Because like, it's, like, it's like trying to put the, the 20th floor of a skyscraper in before you've built the fifth floor. Right. You have to know, you know if, if, you can imagine the, if you can imagine the knowledge set of each student being a skyscraper, you have to understand what floor they're up to. Because uh, if you have a number of students operating on the fifth floor and you're teaching at a 20, 20th floor level, uh, th that information is gonna, isn't going to stick. You have to teach them sixth floor stuff if they've got the fifth floor down. Uh, on the flip side of that, if they're up to the 20th floor and you're delivering them fifth floor stuff, they're going to be bored and you're going to lose them. And um, so you have, yeah. you have to know where the students are. And, um, and uh, professors who are teaching in large university settings... Um, you know, they, they can't possibly they can't. do that for every student. Um, so the student has to know where their knowledge set is, too. So uh, if you're going to walk into a large university setting, um, it's, it's even more important to do your homework and understand what the teacher is going to be introducing and making sure that, you know, what, what, they're, what they are teaching should be, should be just, beyond your, uh, just beyond your knowledge set. Yeah. It, um, for... So to explain that in kind of a, a simpler or more uh, tangible term, there's uh, different levels of music theory, right? Mm -hmm. But if you if you teach a kid uh, how to do scales, that's 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 the basic, or what notes are, mm -hmm. right? You can't you don't do that to. Uh, you have to realize that that kid, you know, that they're starting at level one. If you're talking to a college student, you could probably talk to them about diminished. And augmented mm -hmm. chords, mm -hmm. you can't explain that to a kid yet because they right. don't have the foundation. Of where are they going to put that? Mm -hmm. It's going to be oh, I know augmented and diminished chords are a thing. I don't know what that means. Right? Though. Yeah. Right. It all starts with the scales. Yeah. It all starts uh -huh. with the scales and, mm -hmm. and those relationships. So, so um, in regards to music, or what what is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started? Music. Music. Huh. Um, or uh, teaching. You can't, you can't create in a vacuum. Mm. Um, my dad's an artist, and he, he always said that. Uh, um, and not, not a musical artist. He's, he's a potter and painter. And uh, when I started writing songs, I, I really, really, really tried to... I don't want to... I, I want this song to just, you know, it, like, like it's going to... You know, people talk about those muses... It's, it's going to come to me kind of like mystically from nowhere and it's, it's going to, it's going to flow this way and that way. Um, I'm, and I, I and I think Paul McCartney, uh, I think he gets credited for it, something to the effect of uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Yes. Uh, as a songwriter, um, as a songwriter, I still feel like I have a, have a long way to grow. Um, but uh, I am, I am unashamed of sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a song that feels like this song. Mm -hmm. This this song all, is already there. 
this is what I feel, and I'm going to this. This is going to be my foundational um, uh, approach. And by the time you're done with it, the song sounds nothing like the the song or the style that inspired you. But but it it, it helps a lot to have that foundation Give because the because the, the the songs that I tried to write from a vacuum sound like. Um, you know, so you know, nothing, thank you. nothing against Philip Glass, but it's it's very it's very like, what the hell? What the hell is that? What is uh, what are you trying to uh, what are you trying to do here? Uh, yeah, that was an interesting chord change, but why? But why? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, and 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 theory, you know, music theory kind of gives you those guardrails, and um, and uh, you know, it works for a reason, and there is a. Um, you know, I, I kind of I kind of think of it as 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 kind of a, uh, imagine imagine a, a bullseye. Imagine a bullseye with a single circle in the middle, and then two concentric rings around it. Okay, and and I'm trying to I'm trying to write songs that are in that middle ring that surrounds the bullseye, because in the bullseye, I- imagine the most cliche songs ever, mm-hmm. being squarely in the bullseye. You know. Heart and soul, happy birthday, the Wonder absolute, <laughs> the absolute, yeah, Wonderwall. <laughs> Funny thing, we, we, you know, I've covered Wonderwall, and what I think is a pretty twisted and, and interesting way, but, um, but you have that, you have that absolute cliche in the middle, and uh, and out in the periphery, you have, um, you know, that you have uh, 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 David Burns' uh, lowest selling album, whatever. Mm-hmm. So you have something that is way, way out there. You you want to try to get out of the boundary, of the, you know. Cliche is there for a reason. It's, these yeah. these are songs that fit. These are they songs work. that that work. They match expectations, but you want to break expectations. You want to break expectations in a way a that still way. has an eye to that still has an eye to uh, you know again for lack of a better word cliche, but you're throwing somebody something familiar. And then you're you're putting a you're putting a spin on it, and um, you know sorry about the, all the baseball analogies here, mm-hmm. but you're 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 it's 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 coming in the way you know it looks like a fastball, and then at the last minute it breaks, and from a, from a pitcher's standpoint that's satisfying. That's like yes, that's exactly what I wanted to do, because um, because I'm following the typical path, and I've given you something different, and and sometimes that. Sometimes that stretching, sometimes going outside of that of that bullseye of cliche, uh, then becomes cliche. Yeah. You, what you've done is you've stretched the boundaries, and now that becomes acceptable. And then you have to push a little farther. Um, but it, it is it is um, amazing how after after centuries of making what what for lack of a better term we can call pop music. Um, the the songs are the songs that you would listen to from 400 years ago are still recognizable and they're, they're still within the boundaries we have not our brains don't want to break the boundary too far now if you're going for something else i mean there are people who are seeking that that, that discomforting ex- yeah. uh, that that mind breaking and and that can be very useful um but but it's it's my experience that that that's not their go to album Course. That they come back to every three years. I mean, I'm sure you have those albums. I have those albums where, where I will just, I will just go on a month listening to the, to this particular album. Uh, you know, it's like okay, time to go back to this one again and listen to it um, for a month. And um, and uh, there, there's a reason why we we keep getting drawn back to the center. And again, I think it it goes back to the expectations and the foundational uh, patterns that we have in our brains about what what language and conversational tones should be. Um, really hem music in, and uh, it's our job as songwriters to take to take the familiar, and then just push, just push on that wall and see how far, see where the wall is weak, find out where the wall is strong, and push out at the squishy spots. Yeah, and, and so you mentioned that quote. Uh, people don't realize, but there's there are so many stuff that's been stolen from other artists. Uh, mm-hmm. John Williams took the famous Star Wars theme there, uh, four, like 400, 500 years ago, somebody wrote that in a classical piece mm-hmm. and he just borrowed it, put yeah. it into Star Wars yep. uh, with minute changes. Ice Ice Baby and Under Pressure by oh, Queen. Oh, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite literally, yeah. almost, uh-huh. in some, yeah. some spots, or, or stolen. Right. Um, and, it's, and they're both really good songs right. that yeah. people... Uh, jam to all the mm-hmm. time 
it and it's not to say that you're you're treading on someone else's work it's just it's moving it along it's it's progressing it it's right. evolving it it's adding your spice to it and that's kind of what human history is is mm-hmm. everybody right. adding their own spice onto stuff that's centuries and centuries right. old yep it's i'm curious what are your thoughts or if you have any on music therapy um again does it work probably has it been scienced um you know music therapy kind of falls under this umbrella of what do you find um, calming and satisfying? Mm. So w- would music therapy work to somebody like you and me for oh. whom music is, is, is wonderful and central to our lives? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, but, but, but again, folks like you and me forget that there are a lot of people who don't give a hoot about right. music. And if you think that you're going to get through to this kid with music therapy and they are just not inclined to be a, a musician, uh, you'll probably be disappointed. And you might be investing a lot of money in, a, in one therapy that is not beneficial at the cost of another one that is. Mm. Um, uh, similarly, um, when, it, when it's music therapy, art therapy, whatever these therapies are, and again, not to disparage these therapies, but every one of these therapy approaches involves, um, uh, typically involves one-on-one attention from a right. caring adult. Yeah. So do, could I believe in Lego therapy? Could I believe in, you know, I'm, I'm an electrical geek. Could I believe in soldering therapy? I think soldering is therapeutic. Right. Um, uh, I, I just think that it's dangerous to assume that... Um, that because it works show for me show me how you diagnose a kid in right. need of music therapy and show me how that kid differs from the kid who has been diagnosed as needing art therapy mm. and then show me that the kid who you diagnosed as needing art therapy gets more progress with art therapy than they would with music therapy than they would with you know there's whatever you know, else horse therapy whatever um, I don't think that uh, if you're talking about a kid who enjoys music, does music therapy work? Probably, because one-on-one attention from a caring adult works. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, again, I, I just don't think music therapy has been scienced out yet. It sounds good. It sounds um, fun. It sounds it sounds safe because you know here's something that a kid can do expressively. Um, but but uh, is music therapy better than poetry therapy? Is music therapy better than um, uh, you know, swim therapy? You name it. Mm-hmm. If if music therapy is a thing, there should be an unequivocal way to demonstrate that you can diagnose somebody in need of music therapy, and then demonstrate that the kids that you diagnose in need of music therapy do better with music therapy ben. than they would with art therapy. Gotcha. And I just don't think that has been done. It, it, I know I'm making it, a lot of people no, cringe out there. No, I mean, because you make a good point because there are so many people that take something at face value and there's people who take stuff off. You get confirmation bias, right? Confirmation bias. Confirmation yeah. bias is so dangerous mm-hmm. and uh, to the to the human experience. Right. And it's, you're, you're right. It, if Because here's something that uh, that will confuse a lot of people. People, there are some people who do homework to music and they get it done way faster. If I if I end up listening to they music, they say they get it done way faster. Or well, yeah, <laughs> or or it helps them concentrate or whatever, uh-huh. right? But if yeah. I listen to music, uh uh-uh, I'm yeah. think especially as a music composer, I'm thinking about all the intricacies and oh, what was that sound? <laughs> it was it was really funny. Uh, I, I used to listen to single ladies a lot, but it's only recently that I I realized they have that mm-hmm. like record scratch. All yeah. throughout the song, mm-hmm. and I can't listen to it anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just so crazy how our perceptions about certain things can change yeah. so quickly. I, so, would the question be, "Oh, what, does it work now? Will it ever fall away? What does is that a a concrete position for them, or is that changing based off of their own uh, their own likes and their own personality?" Mm-hmm. I wonder. I wonder. 
because there, I, I'm spe- I'm not an expert. I'll say I'll preface that, but there are certain innate fears, or or th- there seems to have been that uh, that humans have. Oh, like if we see a spider, mm-hmm. no, no matter what, you're gonna be yeah. scared of it. If you right. hear a certain thing, like uh, humans have, and you, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, but humans have this innate fear of low sounding uh, things. Mm-hmm. Uh, be for whatever reason, I want. Mm-hmm. I wonder how that's if that like what what at what point does something become hereditary versus uh, environmental? Yeah, influence? well, um, you know, I'm I'm an evolutionary psychologist, and I think there's good reason to um, uh, for people to to be scared of spiders. Historically, of we're scared of spiders. We're scared of snakes. Things that move like snakes are are terribly uncomfortable to us, you know, when we see that, that wiggling pattern. Um, uh, you know, and there are people who, who, if they have that spider phobia, um, I do. you know, right. Um, and, and spiders have been a danger to us uh, for much longer than guns have, for example. So when, you, but guns kill probably many more people in the United States than spiders do. I don't have the stats at the, at the tip of my uh, you know, my I'd fingertips here. <laughs> um, but if you show pictures of guns to people and pictures of spiders to people, you'll get much more of an emotional reaction to those spiders than the guns. So you would think that behaviorally, after reading newspaper stories after about the, you know the horrific mass shootings, you would think that that we would learn to have a conditioned fear of the guns in the same way we'd have a, a conditioned fear of the spiders. But we don't. Um, uh, you know, same with same with blood. Um, uh, I remember, uh, you know, a, a kid, I think, you know, when I was in um, uh, uh, kindergarten, I think it was, um, getting my tonsils out. The kid in the hospital room or in the same hospital room saw blood and foom, passed out. Passed out, the first yeah. time I ever saw that. And, um, you know, I was like, what's that about? What, what's there to be What's there to be afraid of at the sight of blood? And, um, you know, one, one explanation is could be, you know, you play dead. You, if, if, if something, if, if, if you're witnessing someone else suffering, then the, the, a, a good strategy might be to be as unnoticeable to, uh, to whatever caused that blood as possible. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, we don't, you know, we were scared of heights. You know, think of the thing, you know, I, I remember the old World Trade Centers. There, there used to be in the observation deck of the old World Trade Centers, there used Class. to be the regular floor. And then there used to be like a six inch step down right up against the glass. So you were actually kind of like stepping down as oh, you were putting your face against the glass. And it was. It was terrifying. And, um, you know, where does that come from? I had never been in a, in a massive building like that. But, there, you know, there's something inside me that said, you better you pay better attention to what's up, going yeah. on. Um, so, yeah. I wonder, I wonder if after so long of hearing the Western style of music, if that's, uh, if that, has maybe slowly become hereditary for the Western uh, people. Yeah, there's a chicken and egg thing there. Is yeah. it is it popular because uh, you know it's the the the, it works the, Beatles, the Beatles went all over the world. Yeah. Um. You know. Uh. So. Um. So I I I think we're I think we're treading on thin ice when we look at quote unquote a people mm. and say. They appreciate this music. They don't appreciate this music because what you're what you're doing is that you're suggesting that there's a brain wiring that is um, that is different, uh, and and I think the similarities uh, are far 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 greater than the differences are. Mm. And you will have different styles of music emerge from different areas that that would probably serve a purpose. You know, like this. This is music that was created and sounds it sounds strange to one set of ears, but what you don't realize is that when you're hearing the music in isolation, maybe it was music that was designed to accompany a walk through a garden mm. where the music was not supposed to be central to your experience. It was supposed to just be uh, it was just supposed to be something like the uh, the the dripping of water. Um, in which case, uh, the understanding of of that music and that style uh, is instantly universal. Um, I think that um, you know. I think that when it comes to music, I think that what we're learning is that uh, is that we're all drawn to 
that most of us across the planet are drawn to the same things for the same reasons. And again, it, it goes back to language because of the importance of language. There's no, it, it, language is central to the human experience. The individual who is deprived of language or who doesn't understand language is, 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 at, is at risk of, of ostracism and, and solitude. Um, so so I, I, think, I think even even when you look at that music that might be from a culture that you're not familiar with, even when it sounds strange, once you put it in context, once you understand where it came from, you'll probably get it. You'll probably say, oh yeah, okay, now that connects with me. There's an there's a African tribe that whenever someone is born, they create a specific song just for them. Mm -hmm. And have you heard of them? No. But, uh, no. but what will happen is if they ever do like a crime or something against the tribe... What they'll what they'll do instead of punishment, mm -hmm. uh, they'll all gather around the, that person and start singing that song, Ooh. right? And imagine yeah. the conviction, yeah, uh, that that has on that person. Yeah, I, it's incredible the cultural impact a song can have on one specific because for that person that's got to be. It's your name. It's, it's your. It's your. Yeah. Na it is. Mm -hmm. It's almost synonymous with your name exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you do something bad and they come around you and support you like that, mm -hmm. you got the amount of feelings, overwhelming feelings yeah. mm -hmm. of from the, you got nostalgia from the past when they right. when they've sang to you uh, in a more loving in a more uh, celebratory way maybe, right. and now uh, I it's it's incredible how our brain can be wired to listen to a like for example there's a song. Um, Everyone has that song that they had with their uh, previous partner. When they listen to it, <laughs> they just turn it off immediately, uh -huh, or they start uh -huh, a breakdown. Yeah, uh -huh. Right? Uh, my mother used to sing Creed's uh, "Wide and Arms Wide Open." Uh huh. Whenever I hear that, I can't skip it because my mother has passed now. Oh, sorry. Um, but uh, whenever I listen to it, I listen yeah. to the full thing, uh -huh, and it's right. so many emotions yeah. come over me because it's that particular song. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious. If I want to, I want to know why, and I, I want. I guess it does come back to language mm -hmm. the, and the just emotions and the feelings and and brought into the uh, physical. Right, right. Well, everything else, all the other associations you made with it yeah. too, because um, it, it, it's it's the memories, it's um, it's the circumstances. Um, you know, you probably remember where you were when you were hearing that song, at least in a number of different occasions, and. Um, and yeah, for as um, you know, you know, for for as for as yeah, you I'll know, say it corny as that song is. It's right. it's you know, if if somebody drops that song on you in that time of your life, I totally get it. I totally you know, I see the connection. It's you know, with the he's a very earnest singer, and right. uh, and the um, and the message is 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 very you know, it's 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 very it's very emotional. It's very um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very sincere. If you had any advice to give to younger musicians or even students, what would it be? Um, um, graze. You know, go, go listen to what everybody else is, is excited about. Uh, find live performances. Support live performances. Uh, don't, don't, don't restrict your... Uh, you know, having Spotify at your fingertips mm. is wonderful. Um, but go see what people are doing, uh, if not only to support the live venue, but to see how people do it, to see how people, um, to see how people create an experience. Um, I am, I am very excited about seeing, um, uh, the Balkan brothers, uh, they're going to be at Telus 360, uh, coming up. And these are, first of all, they're two brothers, mm -hmm. which to me as the father of a drummer and a guitarist really connects with me. Right. I met the Balkan brothers at a, and, and they're just guitarist and drummer. And you, oh, so it's really, it's, it's really, that's it. It's just the two of them. And, um, and traditionally from a rock band, I've, I've thought that I've been operating in the bare bones system by playing in a three piece with the Ferris. Okay. They're just two of them. And, um, and they cover they cover the sonic space with, with just two of them without a bass player. Huh. And, uh, and watching how they, you know, most, most people would say that's not enough to have a band. And that's not enough to, certainly not enough to have a live show. 
Right, but they do it. They do it, and and you know the white stripes had the same impact yeah. when they when they first started off. Um, but looking at looking at artists who are not delivering the same formula, you know, you could go see a four piece or a five piece uh, pop roots combo anywhere, where there be uh, drum, bass, two guitars and a keyboard, drum, bass. Uh, two guitars and uh, uh, you know saxophone. Who knows whatever. There once once you have that that typical foundation, it's easy to quote unquote create music and create and meet the crowd's expectations. When you do something like the White Stripes do or what the Balkan Brothers do, and you just put the two of them on stage, and you go, wow, I there's they're pulling that off. They're they're holding my attention. They're you know, as a musician, they're covering the sonic space, and they're they're doing this because they recognize where the potential holes would be, and they're reaching out and filling them. Sometimes they're leaving the holes there on purpose, um, but find find those acts who are presenting themselves atypically, mm. and and see how they have um, uh, how they make see, it. See how they make it. See how they see how they they tackle that different approach. What is one thing that you didn't expect? Uh, when you went into the music industry? One thing, I mean, in the industry, I flatter myself to say I'm part of the industry. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm pretty peripheral. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a gigging guy. Um, what didn't I expect? I didn't expect the bottom to fall out of live music. Um, oh, really? In the, oh, yeah. In the, in the 90s, in the 90s around here, uh, and I think it's everywhere, in the 90s around here, um, uh, you could gig three nights a week, uh, and any and any establishment that had twelve square feet of space on their floor would be hiring live music. Uh, that evaporated partly with um, partly with social media, I think, partly with the the advent of the iPhone, because um, people people are connecting on their phones in the way that they needed to use. Live music. The, uh, the live music to, to do it. And that, huh. that's hurt. That's hurt a lot. And, um, and uh, the musicians, the, the importance of putting out an album, um, which, which to me, as, as I've said, I'm, I'm a procrastinator when it comes to recording, uh, I have no incentive to put out an album anymore. You record one song at a time, it's all singles archive now. it some. It's all singles, which is kind of funny because that's the way music started. That's the way. Right. Yeah. That's you know that was that was Elvis. Elvis was all singles. It's all singles now, and and weirdly, YouTube has also encroached on this. You know, you have so many YouTube stars. So uh, if you want to get discovered, you're not going to get discovered because uh, an agent. From God, e- yeah. EMI right. fa- finds you, you're gonna because you, th- those agents are are they don't exist anymore. Everybody is scouring YouTube. Yeah. Everybody's scouring YouTube for trends and um, and uh, the the loss of the album has gone along with that. You know, you have references to to Queen, the Night at the Opera. These artists, these artists felt the need to construct. Two, two like acts in a play. They, you know, a good album is two 22, 25 minute performances, side one, side two. Uh, that's gone. Um, and there are there are artists who still operate like that, but I find that they're the older ones. Mm-hmm. Um, I I I don't know if we'll get that back, and that's I'm I'm kind of sad about that. And maybe that's my problem because I'm an old man. Um, but that, but that challenge for an artist to go into the studio and put together a cohesive set of, of music, of music, um, it's I don't I don't know I don't know who would bother with that anymore. It's a, well, it's a, it's an art form for mm-hmm. sure. I'm but I'm uh, I'm still seeing a lot of people put out even younger musicians uh, around here put out albums. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm hopeful for it because I, I I never really paid attention to the albums. Like when I say Queen, I, I you know I just listen to their Bohemian Rhapsody, their uh, mm-hmm. Don't Stop Me Now, their you know their main hits. I right. I never really sat down and listened to an album, uh, but that's something I'm starting to do more and more is listen mm-hmm. to albums as a whole whole piece yeah. and finding those singles that are like just a piece of candy within within that whole storyline. Mm-hmm. 
And when your friends are putting out an album, you know, no, no disrespect to them, but I don't think I would have an album in me because mm. to set out to write an album, the songs have to fit together. Again, like acts in a play uh, and well, scenes within the acts. There's a reason the first song is the first song. There's a reason the second right. song is the second. And you know, it builds and finishes in a, in a way that is, that is, that is a 45 minute performance. Um, and recording 10 songs over your, over a year, right, and course. then just putting them on and saying, well, I'm going to put this song on the beginning of side one because it's my strongest, and I'm going to put this song on the beginning of side gotcha. two, and then I'm going to put the quiet ballad at the end. Um, uh, that's not the same as, 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 const as, as constructing that cohesive piece. Um, so what is one thing? What is... Give me your top three albums to listen to. Oh, jeez. Uh, oh, I hate doing that because um, because as soon as I walk out the door, I'll, I'll think, oh, think of way I more. Wish, wish I hadn't done that. Um, uh, Van Morrison's Moon Dance. Um, you know, even if even if I sometimes skip the song Moon Dance itself, <laughs> uh, there's um, you know the the sax on Into the Mystic is is fantastic. Um, oh, jeez! I'm, I'm, I'm like I've got all these albums swimming in my head. Which ones? Which ones do I pick out? Um, uh, you know, Salt Hill is very much influenced by the Water Boys and the um, uh, Fisherman's Blues album. Uh, is a is a wonderful example of um, of uh, of of listening to a band transition from being. You, you literally hear from side one to side two, you hear the band stepping out of, um, of, of one style of 80s music, and then by the time the album is over, they have just fallen into, um, into this modern Irish traditional sound. And, uh, and, and the, the, I, I, it, it's kind of unfair for me to pick this album because I'm so invested in the in where the album was recorded, I, I know the building that the album was recorded in on the west coast of Ireland, and I I I I know the feel of that town, and um, and uh, and everything there. And and to me, that album, not th there are there are personal reasons that that I love that album. Mm -hmm. That that y you know when when you tell somebody this is a great album, they cannot possibly. Um, they cannot possibly understand all of the, like you said right. about the Creed song. They can't. They can't possibly appreciate everything that song means to you, and uh, it's not going to hit them in the same way. Um, but that album was great for that. And then, geez, um, uh, Carbon Leaf's "Indian Summer" um, was a song that that hit me when um, uh, when my kids were young, and my family kind of grew up with that album. As as kind of a soundtrack to the, you know it's it's a wonderful album music musically, and um, and it was also an album that even at their young age at, at a young age my kids identified with, and we can't we kind of became like family stalkers of the band following them around you know we've got family pictures of ourselves with them, um, and uh, and they they again were one of those bands that in the early days of, of Salt Hill kind of shaped what I saw was possible. Um, uh, they bring in a lot of, they'll, they'll do like full rock one minute and then they'll bring in very kind of a, a traditional instruments and, mm. and do very strange instrumentations. I can go on and on and on and I'm leaving out this and I'm leaving out that. Um, but, but you asked for three and there, you go. there are three. So last question. What is one of the funniest things, or maybe worst things, that ever happened to you on a gig? On a gig, um, I remember, geez, going up to Penn State. I, we had a we had a gig booked in Penn State, and I think there were there was probably six inches of packed snow on the ground. Oh no! And our vehicle was a we had a Dodge Tradesman van, nineteen seventy eight Dodge Tradesman van. And I remember driving up Route 283, um, and there were ruts in the road because nothing had been plowed, and somehow our van had the clearance for this. And I, I just remember we're gonna 
you know, there are no cell phones. It was just going, we're going right. to, we're going to freeze and I'm going to die. I mean, you know, we're just, we're just going to die. And this is the dumbest reason to die. Um, and, uh, some, and, and again, we didn't have like satellite radar. We didn't know how much worse it was going to be as we got up there. But as we got, as we got west of Harrisburg, miraculously, the snow kind of was, was in the, uh, opposite direction as, as it was everywhere else. But, um, but yeah, I, I just remember being in the band going, this is, this is crazy. Adults, adults don't, don't do things like that. <laughs> um, but we got there. That's one that's, we got there. Yeah, we got there and it was, it was an uneventful gig after that. But, uh, but yeah, there, there, those times, you know, there are times when you're sitting there with your buddies going and you're not saying it out loud, but you're going, we're, this is really dumb. We're going to, we're going to, this isn't going to end well. And this isn't going to happen ever again. This isn't going to happen ever again. I'm going to die in a 1978 Dodge Tradesman. The, not a very not a very dignified way to go. Well, Sean, this has been a wonderful time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. If you want to check out his stuff, please be sure to check out the description. All of his Facebook and Reverb Nation stuff will be there. Check him out tomorrow at the uh, Stoner, Stoner Grill. Grill right? Yep. Yeah, Stoner Grill tomorrow and... All of his upcoming gigs are will be on uh, in the description as well. Or you can check out his Facebook page and give him a like and share there. With all that said, my name is Corey Rosen. This has been the Story Podcast. Please be sure to check out our uh, also, also blah, blah, blah. check us out on Spotify. Check out our shop. We have stickers and s- shirts and sweatshirts with the first 50 guests on the back. And if you want to support us, please be sure to like, share with your friends. And you know what? If you have someone that you would like to be on, please be sure don't hesitate to reach out. I'm open and I have a lot of time. I'm only 22. <laughs> so please be sure to reach out to me. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Tomorrow, we're going to be having a guest, Don Grabowski, who has created these awesome gloves for musicians that they help with arthritis, they help with uh, calluses. And all that stuff. And I'm really excited to talk to him because he it, he's a local guy who does stuff internationally. Uh, or sells his product, product internationally. I'm really excited to talk to him and his business and how that all works. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.